This video is sponsored by Crimson Manifesto, Knuckles OX, and Jelpy. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Quick heads up, what you're about to see is a compilation of my first what if slash video ever. So the audio in the majority of the beginning parts is very scuffed and my storytelling has vastly improved since then. However, for a multitude of reasons, me wanting to still archive those original videos as well as being way too lazy to re-record over two hours of the content, I'm gonna be leaving those old projects mostly intact. Obviously shaving off the intros, outros, and recaps. However, I will be leaving the preamble of part one as well as the entirety of the finale since it has some important content. Context. That said, I do hope you enjoy and go easy on me if you don't mind. Now, on to the show. What's up, Plus Ultra fam? It's me, Plus Ultra Man, and today we're here to finally do our first what if on the channel. I'm very excited, so let's get to it. At this point, we shall be very familiar with the start of Dragon Ball Z. The original manga chapter, right as had his debut, came out in 1988, and he appeared in the anime only a year after that. Not to mention, there are a ton of Dragon Ball Z games that will follow his storyline and show the player how it all went down. Personally, Raditz is one of my favorite characters in the series, mostly because he had so much potential, yet none of it was really tapped into. Thankfully though, a lot of people have taken notice of this. Moscow X did his amazing What If Raditz Turned Good series, one of my favorite Dragon Ball Z games of all time, Budokai Tenkaichi 2, had a What If Saga in it that had Raditz Turned Good called Faker Brothers. Toyotaro wrote his amazing Dragon Ball Zero manga, which was an origin story for Raditz. And there are countless other fanfics and other fan creations that will give Raditz a bigger part in the storyline. So that being said, I think it's high time that I gave my interpretation. But for that, I don't want to make Raditz turn good. At least not instantly. I want to leave him as the same ruthless and cruel Saiyan warrior he was at the beginning of the series for at least a very good amount of time. He will change at some point, but for now, he'll stay who he is. But you've heard the thumbnail. So how am I going to get Raditz to remain who he is and yet get Goku to join me? Raditz at this point in time was the pinnacle of evil to Goku. Hence why he and Piccolo teamed up to beat him. But at the same time, Raditz was also the pinnacle of strength to Goku, hence why he and Piccolo teamed up to beat him. Strength, as we all know, is the best way to get through to Goku. So, in this timeline, we're going to make two very small changes. Number one, we're going to give Raditz a very small Zenkai boost before he even meets Goku. And number two, we're going to give him a companion. In the Dragon Ball Zero manga I mentioned earlier, there's a small tournament held to determine which of the Saiyans will be allowed to go out and conquer planets. Raditz and his team were actually too weak to win this tournament, but because of some Good teamwork and clever cheating, they came out on top. But in this timeline, Raditz would actually take a more severe beating than he did in the original story. This would warrant at least a two day trip to the healing tanks, which actually works out because the planet was going to destroy it three days after that tournament. After Raditz is all healed up, he and his team, which was made up of him, a young Turles, and an unnamed Saiyan that we had never met before named Rysello, would embark to a planet called Dissent, where they would face monsters that were much too strong for them to beat. Again, they've cheated because they're not strong enough to finish this. Unfortunately, as in the original timeline, Roncello would die, but Raditz's power boost would gain him enough power to save he and Turles. In the original story, he's listed at a power level of 517. So let's take him from that 517 to about a 580 or maybe a 590. He's nowhere near strong enough to take down these monsters, but he is strong enough to carry he and Raditz away. He and Turles away for a long enough period of time to rest. The two young Saiyans will be saved by Vegeta and Nappa. And this would be how Vegeta's team was formed. This would also bring the total number of Saiyans who were under Vegeta's rule to three. And with those two small changes out of the way, we can now fast forward to age 761. The original Dragon Ball timeline would not have changed other than the two changes I've just made. Goku has defeated Piccolo Jr., married Chi Chi, and had his son Gohan. His power level is also at the same because again, no changes have been made. He is now sitting at 416 in power level. Rats and Turtles would land on planet Earth and emerge from their pods using their scouters to scan the nearest life form. Sadly, this would be the farm with a shotgun, who, needs to say, would have a much worse day because he'd have two unruly Saiyans to deal with instead of just one. After this, the two Saiyans would locate the near strongest power level, which would be one of 322 from, coming from Piccolo, who was training nearby in the mountains with his weighted training gear on. Remember, at this point in time, nobody in the Freezer Force could sense or hide their own key, so Piccolo would have sensed the two invaders way before they had gotten to them. Now, if we're adapting Toyotaro's Dragon Ball Zero, that would mean that in the original storyline, Raditz would have went from a power level of 517 to a power level of 1500. But in this storyline, we'll say that he's gone from a power level of 580 to a power level of 2000. Why am I making such a big jump? Well, in the story, Raditz is shown to have a lot of admiration for Bardock. I think that admiration would give him a lot more pride in this storyline. Not only that, having Turles beside him, so he would not be the weakest in the group, but also give him more pride. He'd feel a lot more ambitious to go out and conquer stronger planets. He'd probably have 
harder battles that would result in more Zenkai boost for him. But again, this is still Raditz, so he would get no respect from Vegeta and Nappa. But he is also able to be the side man of this story. Turtles would be very close behind Raditz. I think he'd be at Raditz's original power level. The two Saiyans would then fly to Piccolo's location. Landing there and finding a Mechi was very perplexing to the two Saiyans. They would laugh it off and determine that he was, no, he was of no threat to them and leave. Piccolo, on the other hand, was shocked. A new warrior had appeared, stronger than any he had ever met before. But because of Turtles' resemblance to Goku, he would assume that this was Goku and that Goku had gotten way stronger. As always, Piccolo would need time to stop and process all this information, yet he wasn't feared. The two Saiyans would then start flying to the direction of Kami House, sensing a cluster of power levels that were bigger than normal in that area. Again, they are easily sensed, so Goku would already be out on the beach at Kami House, waiting for them. Once seeing the other Saiyan, the two Saiyans would stop, laugh, and land. Raz would comment on how Goku looked just like Bardock in his younger days, yet he was nowhere near the power level he needed to be. Turtles would cut in as he always did, making jokes at Kakarot's weakness. The two Saiyans would then be begin berating the younger one because the planet was still full of life, asking if the green Namekian had defeated him. Goku, being extremely confused, would try and stop them and get them to explain themselves. Raditz would begin questioning if he had brain damage, and once Goku had confirmed that yes, he had taken a blow to the head as a baby, Raditz would begin to inform him on everything that was meant to be told by the Saiyan race. Needless to say, these were complete bombshells to Goku. He was not of Earth, and he was actually sent here to destroy the Earth. He would not be in a very talkative mood at the moment. Not to mention, Krillin is very aware of how strong Raditz and Turtles are. He would not approach them. And so, this confrontation would not become violent. There would be no ill will actually portrayed to the humans. The two Saiyans are too focused on their young counterpart. Since he's not talking, Raditz has time to look around, and he notices that Goku does not have a tail. Again, the two older Saiyans are again teasing him on his lack of power. Especially at the fact that he could not unlock his true power through the Ozaro form. Hearing the idea of more power being unlocked, Goku would question them what his Ozaro form was, and the two Saiyans would elaborate on what the Great Ape transformation was. This would allow Goku to put two and two together, and he would realize that he was the one that had crushed Grandpa Gohan. Again, this gives Goku pause, and he has to stop and process this information. And again, Raditz allows him this time. He would then look around once again and notice the small Saiyan boy. His brother had had a kid and also that the Earthlings were able to reproduce with the sand. This information would actually prove to be the salvation of Earth in the long run. As he always did, Turtles would cut in and begin teasing and taunting his best friend Turtles. In the story, they're shown to be very good friends. As I said, their teamwork is amazing, and I imagine it would be a similar relationship to Tori and Bardock, always teasing and taunting each other as they were close friends in the table. Turtles would cut in saying, well, Raditz, even though you're stronger, your brother has a kid, you can't say that. The two then begin to bicker back and forth and maybe even wrestle a bit. Now this would actually help their situation. Goku, seeing that they had more emotion than just their usual bravado, would see that these guys might not be all that bad. Not to mention, they've only spoken about doing bad things. He hasn't actually seen them attack anybody. So, as blunt as he always would, Goku would cut into the conversation, asking if his brother could actually make him as strong as he was. And here, Raz would have his end to start manipulating his brother. See, in this timeline, there would actually be no real need to go and get Kakarot. The planet the Saiyans had originally been deciding to go conquer and sell would have been easy work having Turtles there, who at this point was much stronger than Goku. But in this timeline, the entire band of Saiyans was not going to just conquer this planet. It was actually just going to be Raditz and Turtles. And they had decided that they needed help, and therefore would go and recruit Raditz's younger brother. Or at least, this was a story that they had told Vegeta and Nappa. As I've said, Raditz in this storyline has a lot more pride and ambition and would resent being under the two Saiyans' heel and not want to be the weakest in the group anymore. I'd imagine it'd be a very similar situation to Vegeta and Frieza. Vegeta had always wanted to revolt against Frieza, yet even though, at the beginning of the series, he was nowhere near the power level he needs to be, he still had ambitions to the entire time. But Raditz is also a very cautious, cautious and intelligent fighter. He would know that he would need more than just he and Charles to take down the two Saiyan leads. Therefore, he would need his brother's help. Even if his brother would only be fodder in the end, it would still be useful to have him with them. Not to mention the added knowledge that Kakarot had a son, and therefore they would bolster his forces, and the Earthlings could help him make even more Saiyans. So, Raditz would begin telling his brother, yes, he can make him stronger, but he'll never be as strong as he was. Rat Kakarot will always be scum to him. Goku would probably ignore the most, the most part of that insult. He'd be too excited at the prospect of getting stronger. But the idea of killing innocent people was still not appealing to the Saiyan, and therefore the two Saiyan brothers would begin negotiations. Goku would determine that number one, the Earth cannot be destroyed, 
and no humans can be harmed. Number two, he could not kill any innocent people. And number three, he could not be gone too long. Two years at the most. Write us with pause and think about these demands. Number one, the earth not being destroyed was actually a benefit to him. He would need the humans to start repopulating the same race at some point. Number two wasn't a very big problem because he believed at some point he'd be able to, cack to toughen Kakarot up. Number three was the only problem to him. But he would simply decide to lie and tell Kakarot that he would be back within two years. But in return, Gohan would actually have to accompany the Saiyans into space. Again, Goku would have to stop and process information. Now, the idea of training with his son was by no means unappealing, but the idea of training with his sons in space with evil monkey warriors was not that appealing. He would decide that if Gohan was to come, he would have to stay by his side at all times, and he also would not kill anybody innocent. Raz would reluctantly agree to all this, and the two Saiyans would come to an agreement. But this is a Dragon Ball Z what if, therefore we cannot have no action to happen whatsoever. And with that, all the heads at the beach would snap over to the sea. The Saiyans being alerted by their scouters, and the Z fighters alerted by their key sense. There, hovering over the water, maybe a few hundred yards out, would be Piccolo. He's been charging up his special beam cannon for a good amount of time. Now in the original, Piccolo actually fired off two special beam cannons, the second of which was clocked in at a power level of 1330. This was after fighting Raditz and being winded. So in this scenario, he's had more time to do it, he's also had more energy to put into it. So let's say it's going from a 1330 to about an 1880. But the way the special beam cannon works, it is definitely enough to kill anybody on the beach. As he fired it, Raditz would commonly lift up one hand fire a single Sunday, which would impact Piccolo's special beam cannon, and mostly heat it. The attack would then hit Piccolo dead off in the chest and blow him off into the water. But don't worry, Piccolo is by no means out of the story. In fact, he has a very big part to play later. Though so all the inhabitants on the beach would assume him dead, and therefore Kami with them. Before Goku could begin protesting and rethinking his offer, the two Saiyans would lift off into the air and tell Kakarot to meet them back here tomorrow. They would then fly off back towards the area where their pods had landed in, to order Kakarot one. With the Saiyans finally gone, all the humans and the one lone Saiyan and half Saiyan could finally breathe a sigh of relief. Goku would have very quick conversations with the other people on the beach. They'd try and talk him out of going, but I think Goku would tell Krillin to make sure he starts training harder and that he'd have to go and do this. Either way, the Earth would be safe if he went. Though internally, I don't think Goku would be as sure as he was trying to make himself. With that, Goku and Gohan would then fly on the Nimbus Cloud to Korin's tower. Goku would plead with Korin to give him any and all sense of beings he had. Korin would reluctantly comply and give him at least six, which Goku would hide and keep from his brother. He was not fully trust trusting of his brother, and he might need an extra boost of energy to get he and Gohan out of this dangerous situation. He would then fly up to Kami's lookout to check and see if Kami really had died with Piccolo. Thankfully, the older Namekian was still there. Kami, being fully aware of the situation, began trying to counsel Goku, asking him if he would please step into the hyperbolic time chamber and train so he would not have to leave the planet. I think Goku would flat out refuse this offer. Number one, his first experience with the hyperbolic time chamber was a very negative one. And number two, he's seen a power that did not require the hyperbolic time chamber to, to require. So I think he would be set on going with his brother at this point. Goku and Gohan would then fly back to his house to rest for the night. In the morning, Goku would have to sneak he and Gohan out of the house where Chi Chi could even find them. Because there was no way she was going to let Gohan go into space. The two would then arrive at the Kami house where the other two Saiyans were waiting for them. Gohan was still asleep in Goku's arms. With that, the older two Saiyans then called down their pods, as well as a brand new one for Goku and Gohan. Before climbing into their own, Goku would be told to put on his new Saiyan armor instead of those raggedy earthen garments he wore so much. Goku would opt to only put on the Saiyan top and to leave the other pieces behind, stating he did not want to wear underwear when he fought. Raz would then yell at him to get in his pods so they could go. Once lifted off and into space, they began the three-week journey to Planet Freezer number 79. Hearing a conversation between Raditz and Turtles through the scouters, Goku would pick his up, questioning what this was. Raditz and Turtles would then berate him on his idiocy, asking how else would they be able to sense key. And with this, a very beneficial information exchange would begin between the, the three Saiyans. Goku would begin trying to teach them how to sense the key themselves. The two Saiyans wouldn't believe him exactly, but they would at least try to live. Um, Saiyans would then begin telling Goku more about the Saiyan heritage and the inner workings of the Freezer Force. After their teaching moment was done, the two Saiyans decided to go to sleep for the long trip. Goku deciding to follow right after them. We then fast forward to all three Saiyan pods, landing on Planet Freezer number 79. Now here, we're going to make another very small change. The gravity on Planet Freezer number 79 would actually be that, 10 times that of Earth's gravity. I'm not sure that there are any official statements on the gravity level on this planet, therefore we can change it anything we really want to. 
Goku and Gohan will struggle to get out of their pods while Raditz and Turles simply stroll out of theirs. All three, all four Saiyans then enter the facility. Goku and Gohan are given a very quick tour and told to get ready because they're about to begin training for one year. While struggling under the effects of the 10 times Earth's gravity, Gohan and Goku will be given a very quick tour of the facility. They be shown the barracks, healing tanks, mess hall, and finally a big barren room that was used to test blasters for the Frieza soldiers. This is where training would take place for the next year. Once in this room, Raditz and Turtles would round on Goku and begin savagely beating him into the ground, trying to take advantage of his Zenkai boost for him. See, I don't believe that the Frieza Forest really has any idea what training really is, at least not in the traditional sense that we have on Earth. Think of it this way, Frieza only needed 4 months of training to attain his golden form. The only other instance we have of people in space training would be Vegeta when he was a kid against those Cybermen that we see in the Bardock special. Other than that, the idea of training to get stronger seems to be a mostly Earthling idea, in concept at least. My theory is that in space, the idea is to be born strong instead of trying to become strong. Frieza has no real idea of what training is because to him, he is the strongest. There is no level above his. Theoretically though, in Dragon Ball lore, anybody who trains in the Earth traditional way can in fact get stronger. We see this through Frieza, and this could possibly be done to the other alien races we see like Zarbon, Dodoria, and the Ginyu Force. Perhaps they simply grew up on plants with stronger gravity than the normal that we see in Earth. But outside of that, training is a truly alien idea to these people. And nevertheless, the idea of Zenkai boost for Saiyans is the only way they really know of getting stronger. I think that's why Vegeta was facing Cybermen. More to test the potency of his attacks than to actually get stronger. Another good bit of evidence to this is that Vegeta in the original series does in fact want to surpass Frieza and revolt against him. But I think he only thinks he can do this through Zenkai boost. It's through meeting Goku and the other Z fighters that he learns that training would actually be the best way to gain the strength instead of trying to exploit the Zenkai boost. Unfortunately though, this is the way that Raditz and Turtles would decide to train Goku, deciding to beat him savagely into the ground into a bloody pulp until he could not move, just barely conscious enough to look up and notice the two were about to round on Gohan, who at the moment was between bursting into tears and roaring out in rage. The two older Saiyans began stalking towards him, about to do the same thing they did to his father to him. But before they could, Gohan let out a cry of leave my daddy alone and ram himself in the turtles' chest, breaking through his Saiyan armor like he did to Raditz in the original timeline. Before anything else could happen though, Goku would surge forward, kicking Raditz away. While the two Saiyans were distracted by Gohan, Goku had just barely enough strength to reach into his pocket and grab one of the sensor beans he had snuck onto his ship with him before leaving Earth. This would have given him a very sizable Zenkai boost. Number one, because he was beaten almost to near death under 10 times Earth's gravity. So let's say he'd go from his power level of 416 to about a 700. This is a very big jump for him. And it also makes it a lot easier for him to move under the gravity. He's not completely mastered it yet, but he has gotten a lot, e it's gotten a lot easier for him. Goku would then begin berating the older Saiyans on their training techniques, telling them this was not the way to go about this, and going into a whole spiel of how training should go down. Not being very keen to listen to this entire speech, Raditz would cut him off and tell him that he can handle his brat's training, as per their agreement. And with that, the two older Saiyans would call the training for the day to a close, and direct the, the two younger Saiyans to the mess hall to finish eating. After eating their fill of scarfing down the horrible alien food, Goku and Gohan would have been sitting in the quarters they were given for the year of training. And here's where something very interesting happens between the two. Goku has to sit here and console Gohan. Remember, Gohan has just had his first real instance of having one of his rage boosts. He's never felt these emotions really and truly in his life. In the original series, once he had one, Goku is dead by the time he could have actually interacted with Gohan afterwards. But here we get Goku consoling his son, telling him everything will be okay and trying to get him to at least explain to Goku how he even accomplished such a feat. But Gohan, on the other hand, was not enjoying himself whatsoever. This was a horrible experience to him, and he was by no means happy about this. Here, we would have Goku understanding blatantly and bluntly that Gohan was not a fighter. He did not enjoy combat the way he did. In the original series, this is always implied, or it's a situation in which Gohan must fight to protect people. But now, it's something that he honestly has a bit of a choice in, and I think he would express to his father that this was not for him. This would definitely bring the two a lot closer because there would never be a real, real instance of Goku trying to push Gohan into training and fighting when he didn't want to. Nothing like what happened in the Cell Saga would happen here. So now we have to see Goku become a sensei in a way and incentivize his son to train at least a bit so the two of them can get out of this situation alive. And I think the way Goku would go about getting Gohan to train in this situation would be pretty brilliant on his part. 
Goku would commission Gohan to begin giving him a report on all the different technologies and alien species around the space station. And I think this would greatly intrigue Gohan. Not only was this a brand new subject to him, but it was also something nobody on Earth really knew about at this point in time. It would also be pretty advanced. Gohan always seems to be pretty bored with his studies, but this was also something new and from his father. The two would agree that Gohan would only have to train for so long each day before being allowed to walk around the space station with Goku accompanying him and learn about different parts and pieces of the machinery and the alien species. With that satisfied, the father and son would hunger down for the night and sleep. In the morning, their training would resume. The next day, this is how the training would go for about the next three months or so. Basic college students for Gohan and Goku. For those of you who don't know, calisthenics are basically push-ups, sit-ups, and any other physical activity which requires your body weight as the weight you'd use. Goku would decide to do this, number one, to get him and Gohan acclimated to the higher gravity, and number two, to build basic strength for Gohan. During this time, Raditz and Turtles would really have nothing to do. They'd either spend their time around eating, drinking, or going around to berate and bother Goku and Gohan as they train. Raditz and Turtles would have easily taken notice of how quickly Goku and Gohan were growing. Especially Goku, who had almost become an equal to Raditz at this point in power. Gohan's growth was slow, but the amount of power he pulled out during his rage-filled attack against Turles was amazing, and Raditz would have taken very keen interest in Gohan after this point. He would have very closely watched the young Saiyan hybrid, studying his every move and, and trying to get in his head at some point in time. So, when the young boy would go out for his expeditions around the place station with his father, Raditz would accompany them. And here we get another very interesting relationship built between the Saiyans. Gohan and Raditz are both pretty intellectual pe people, and because of that, I think Raditz would enjoy giving lectures and small talks to his uh, nephew, taking him around explaining how the healing chambers work, and even threatening the head doctor in the healing chambers to give Gohan some pens and paper, things so he could do his studies and record his data more effectively. The two would very slowly begin to bond, much like Gohan and Piccolo did in the original series. There, Piccolo did not become a good guy instantly, but you could very slowly see he was starting to soften up. After this, the real training would begin. Goku would start having small spars with Turles and Raditz. At first, he wouldn't be able to keep up very well, but by the time he had gotten up to Turles' power level, his martial arts skill would have helped him get an edge and at least hang with them the two for a good amount of time. And once again, we get another very interesting character reaction between the Saiyans. Raditz and Turles realizing that Goku's skills that he learned on Earth are giving him an edge in battle, and would begin to ask him, very reluctantly mind you, to start helping them refine their own fighting styles. Remember, there really is no idea of training or even martial arts in space at this point in time. Saiyans are really just brawlers, and at the end of the day, if you put a brawler against someone who really knows martial arts, I think the martial arts will win more times than the brawler will. So, a level of respect is beginning to be built between Goku, Turles, and Raditz, because Goku is having to teach them, and the other two Saiyans are realizing that Goku is not as weak as they thought he was. He's just very kind. But that does not stop them from giving the boy very hard beatings, making sure that he would get his Zenkai boots at the end of each day, by putting him in the healing tanks to sleep that night. During this time, and after having him acclimate himself to his 10 times gravity, Goku would begin teaching Gohan the basic Kame style, even going as far to make him wear the weighted training gear he brought with him, because remember, Goku had to remove his Saiyan Gi, or his Turtle Hermit Gi, at the beginning of this story. So that's still with him, and now Goku is wearing that right now, so he can get acclimated and learn in the normal way that Goku did when he was coming up. At the end of the year, the results of everyone's training would be very staggering. Now we're going to go through all these very slowly and one by one, with me giving an explanation of why they've grown to such a level afterwards. First up, we have Gohan, who went from his power level of 1 to a power level of at least 3,500 to 4,000. I'm placing him here, number one, because in the original series, he went from power level of 1 to a power of about 2800. This is also in 10 times gravity and not having exactly a full year of training. Because remember, Piccolo had to have time taken out to toughen Gohan up and get him to the idea of being more than just a scholar in the brain. In this timeline though, he's taking advantage of 10 times Earth's gravity. He also has Goku's training which is a lot softer and would have Gohan react to it a lot quicker than Piccolo's with an entire year. The only reason he has not grown more is because, again, he took a lot of his time out to study the space station and the alien species. Next up is Turtles, who grew from a power level of 1500 to one of 5500. I'm placing him here because he was not exactly able to take advantage of 10 times gravity, nor will Raditz be able to, but he was able to take advantage of a lot of Zenkai boosts because he would have been the one sparring with Goku the most. Again, Raditz would have spent a lot of his time with Gohan studying around the space station. Moving on to Raditz, who would have grown to 8,000 in power level. 
Now, I'm placing him here because I think his ambition and the fact that his little brother and young nephew were growing so quickly would have greatly motivated him. Not only is his pride invigorated at the idea that his bloodline was this strong and had this much potential, but the idea that they were growing faster than him also lit a fire under him to grow stronger as well. So we're placing Raditz at 8,000 in power level. Great job, Raditz. Finally, we have Goku, who by far grew the absolute most. He went from power level of 416 to a staggering power level of 10,000. Now hang on, I'm putting him here for a few reasons. Number one, 10 times Earth gravity. It did a lot for him in King High's plan. Number two, he actually did have a full year to train. In the original timeline, Goku spent about six months trying to get on and past Snake Way. Not to mention a lot of that time was also spent trying to learn the Spirit Bomb and the Kaioken. In this situation, he's only been training himself. The only downtime he's had is to eat, sleep, train Gohan, and help Raditz and Turles refine their martial arts. As per their earlier agreement, Raditz and Turles would take on the planet they had originally planned to conquer by themselves. The only reason Raditz has chosen to honor this deal is because he has enough faith and respect in his brother to not force him to do something he does not want to do. It also doesn't help that Goku is now far stronger than him. Not to mention, Raditz and Turles have now decided they have some questions they need answered for themselves. Number one, they need to know if they conquer planets solely for the pleasure of conquering planets or for the joy of combat. If it's the second, there's really no reason to continue conquering planets. And secondly, they want to test their metal. See, at this point in time, Goku has grown so quickly that he is past Nappa. He's not quite past Vegeta yet, but with maybe another year or so, he could far go beyond the same prince. Remember, Raditz's number one ambition at the moment is to surpass Vegeta, dethrone him as a Saiyan prince, and then take down Frieza. So, the two Saiyan warriors would depart for the planet they had originally decided to conquer, and wait until a full moon. The battle would be extremely fierce, and at the end of it, the two Saiyans would emerge victoriously. Although, they would have taken a lot of damage and just barely gotten out of it. It would be a very similar situation to Vegeta at the end of the Saiyan saga. He would just barely conscious enough to get himself into a pod and fire himself off to Planet Freeza number 79. But this would have answered the two Saiyans' questions. They had realized that Goku had changed them in a way. They now desired combat more than conquest. They also realized that this idea of Saiyan elites really held no salt. If they could take down this planet by themselves, then what was the, the reason for Vegeta to be the prince of all Saiyans? So, crawling back into their pods and firing themselves back to the space station, the two would finally decide to go about their plan. Once out of the healing tanks and taking new scouters, the two would contact Vegeta and Nappa as they were far away and finally tell them that they were done. The rebellion of the Saiyans had begun. Now, Vegeta was very caught off guard by Raditz and Turles' challenge, before he and Nappa burst out laughing at the idea of it. See, Vegeta and Nappa still think that Raditz and Turles are too weak to barely even take on Cybermen at this point. If anything, they believe that Kakarot may have given them a bit more confidence in their skills, but they still find the idea that these two low-class breeds of Saiyan really think they can take them on. The reason Nappa and Vegeta aren't aware of the growth of the low-class Saiyans is because Raditz and Turles had at some point stopped using scouters during their training. This means there was no way for Nappa and Vegeta to listen in on them, or even see the fruits of their training through the readings of their scouters. This was done so Raditz and Toast could start to hone the um, ability to sense key as Goku does. They would put them off a cover so Frieza wouldn't get suspicious, and Vegeta for that matter, but they didn't wear them to sense key anymore. So, with no knowledge of how strong the low-class Saiyans had grown, Nappa and Vegeta are itching for a chance to show them their place. However, this is still an official challenge for Vegeta. So, it's decided that both parties will travel halfway to each other and engage in one-on-one -on -one combat. There's no real information on the structure of Saiyan politics, but in the Dragon Ball Zero manga, it's said that interfering in combat is dishonorable, and much of this timeline is based off that, so we'll be going with that. With that done, everyone but Gohan was ready to go, and the Saiyans would all climb into their pods and begin the six-month journey to a planet between both parties. Nothing interesting happens in those six months of travel. Well, nothing I'll be revealing in this video. Upon landing, both groups of Saiyans would get out of their pods and begin sizing each other up. Before leaving though, Raditz was smart enough to tell the low class Saiyans to keep their power levels hidden. Nappa and Vegeta instantly notice that there are four Saiyans on the other side instead of three, meaning somebody had a kid. Vegeta is very interested in this and begins interrogating the low class Saiyans on the young companion. He believed at first that Gohan was Raditz's son, but Goku proudly proclaims that he is his son and explains that he is also a Saiyan from Earth. Raditz then hits his younger brother for divulging such sensitive information, and Vegeta in the back of his head thinks that after crushing the low class Saiyans, he should go and make a new Saiyan colony on Earth. 
For now though, Vegeta orders Nappa to plant some more Cybermen so both sides are equal numbers, which he does while chuckling. This makes the teams Nappa, Vegeta, as well as two Cybermen versus Turles, Raditz, Goku, and Gohan. Though Nappa and Vegeta have no idea how strong their opponents are. Goku, after a quick scan of the opponent, gets very excited, but he also decides it'd be best if Gohan only took on the Cybermen. This way, Gohan would still contribute but not have to fight much, and I'm sure Gohan would be very happy with this. Gohan and the Cybermen would then walk forward, and as soon as Vegeta gave the signal for the match to begin, there'd be a quick blur of motion, and the Cybermen would explode in a puff of dust, leaving only a Gohan with a grim yet determined look on his face. Remember, Gohan is at 3500 in power level right now, meaning he's almost three times as strong as the Cybermen. He's also had a lot of Raditz's and Goku's influence over the years, so he definitely doesn't like fighting, but he doesn't want his family to be in danger either, and will destroy anything that threatens to do so. So in this case, the puff of smoke would used to be his short green adversary. Vegeta was now extremely intrigued at the power that Gohan had just exerted, and was even able to see that his power rose to about 2000 in that flash of movement with his scouter. He then begins to piece together the fact that the Earthborn stands might have the ability to hide their power level, meaning Raditz and Turtles could have learned this as well. But Vegeta decides to keep quiet for now and continue to test his hypothesis through the Cybermen. Now the remaining Cybermen, for lack of a better word, was shook, but after a strict order from Nappa, it resolves itself and enters the battlefield like the one before it. Learning from its now dead counterpart, this Cyberman went right for the self-destruct technique, only to be devastated when Gohan simply flexed and pushed away like Goku did to Jason Byrne in the Namek Saga. Vegeta is now even more intrigued to Gohan, as the prospect of a Saiyan hybrid with his blood seems very powerful, but he focuses back in on the present to see a gleeful Nappa hop into the battlefield only for Gohan to give up. Giving up got Gohan insulted by Vegeta and Nappa for being a coward, but he received a lot of praise from Goku and Raditz who were proud of his growth and willingness to fight. Turles didn't voice his pride, but he was very proud of his pseudo nephew. After all the praise was done though, Turles decides it's high time he put a Saiyan elite in his place and jumped forward, much to Goku's chagrin. Now in part 2, we established that Turles, after a year of training, had reached a power level of 5500, but he also gained one more Zenkai boost at the end of that part. I also said he was almost beaten to the level Vegeta was after the Saiyan Saga along with Raditz, meaning the Zenkai boost he got could be comparable. Vegeta went from 18,000 to 24,000, and that's a 75% increase, so we'll apply a 50% increase to Turles and Raditz. Turles then decides that he really wants to humiliate the Saiyan elites, and instantly powers up to his full potential, which frightens Nappa and pisses Vegeta off, causing him to break his own scouter. Vegeta then gives the correct line of, his power level is over 8,000. And as soon as Nappa turns his head to check if Vegeta was telling the truth, Turles would already be on him, beating him savagely into the ground. Being blindsided made it almost impossible for Nappa to counter, but he finally caught one of Turles' kicks and turns the tables on him. The two Saiyans then begin a slugfest, which ends in Nappa trying to charge at Turles, but this would backfire against him as the martial arts skills that Turles had picked up over the year of training kicked in at this moment he was able to use Nappa's force against him. Turles then slammed Nappa into the ground with enough force to break his neck and paralyze him putting him effectively out of the fight. He then kicked the big brute over to Vegeta's side with a huge and prideful grin. While Vegeta, angry at Nappa for losing and now being worthless, prepares to kill him, but is stopped by Raditz insulting the prince by saying he would have even less Saiyans to rule over if he killed Nappa. Remember, Raditz is very ambitious in this timeline and wants to take down Frieza. He also knows he'll need as much power as he can to do that and Nappa would be a very big help to that at some point. In the end, he just had to put the big Saiyan elite in his place. Pissed off, Vegeta enters the battlefield, but before Turles had a real chance to even insult the prince, he was on the defensive dodging huge key blasts from his opponent. While in mid-air, Turles couldn't get his bearings and would soon find himself face to face with a boot from Vegeta, and then he was shot off and planted into the side of a mountain. Vegeta then aimed another key blast at the mountain, only to be intercepted by a kick in the stomach by an angry looking Goku. Vegeta then shook off the attack and began to mock his low class opponent, only to receive a speech from Goku about how foolish the idea of low and high classes were. Goku then expresses that through hard work, he and the other Saiyans had grown to this level of strength, which really pisses Vegeta off even more. In only one year, the low class Saiyans that used to be worms under his heel were half as strong as him. He was feeling the same fear Frieza felt years ago without even knowing it. Vegeta then calls a stop to the match as he needs to prove something to himself, and calls for all the low class Saiyans to come at him all at once. Goku wasn't happy to have to share his opponent, but knew in the back of his head that he couldn't win this alone, and resigned to join forces with his brother and son. Gohan, who had just returned from unconscious Turles, was reluctant to join in as well, but he knew he had to face off against the Elite to save his family. We then get a shot of all three low-class Saiyans and Goku's family assuming their poses as Goku did the Saiyan Saga, while Vegeta assumes his own. 
Now remember, Raditz received the same 50% increase from a Zenkai boost that Turles did, and so went from power level of 8,000 to one of 12,000, meaning he'd be the one to do the most damage in this fight, while Goku and Gohan provide him the cover. Vegeta is able to hold off all three Saiyans well enough until Goku and Raditz fall in a perfect synchronicity with each other to overwhelm him while Gohan provides long range attacks to distract Vegeta, much like Goku freezing the Android 17 did in the Tournament of Power. Finding himself cornered, Vegeta resigns himself and formulates a plan to use a powerball to transform into a great ape and crush his opponents, but he also knows he can't do that just yet as two of his opponents still have tails, Raditz and Gohan. Vegeta then gets another idea, and during one of their tag team attacks, is able to get behind Raditz and rip his tail completely off, stunning the long-haired Saiyan and allowing Vegeta to knock him and Goku away as he zooms towards a flustered, yet terrified, Gohan and tore his tail out as well. After this, a savage knee to the face renders Gohan unconscious, and Vegeta then makes his powerball, shocking both Goku and Raditz as he becomes a great ape. Knowing that they could get rid of his tail, Goku and Raditz could knock Vegeta out of the transformation and greatly weaken him. They began trying to do so. This would be hard, however, as Goku does not know the Destructo Disc or Carrier Blade, meaning he thought he would have to tear the giant tail away. And so begins a reenactment of King Kong as Raditz and Goku fly around Vegeta, blasting him away to try and distract him enough so one of them can get his tail and pull it off. This is barely doing any damage, and they're finding it very hard to grab Vegeta's tail, he's completely aware of their plan, and knows to shake them off anytime they get around it. This continues until Raditz notices something behind Vegeta, and gets a very clever idea. He then fires off a double sundae right into Vegeta's eyes, blinding him for a second, and then Vegeta would feel a giant hand wrap around his tail, and a huge foot collide with his back, as his tail was ripped painfully out. Vegeta had forgotten about Turles and his tail. This is the same tactic that Turles and Raditz use in the tournament for the young Saiyans that we see in Dragon Ball Zero. While falling out of his transformation, Vegeta is smart enough to cut off Turles' tail with a key blast, but he does not fall on him like Gohan did in the same saga. Now, with both sides beaten and exhausted, they all face off one final time, Turles, Raditz, and Goku versus Vegeta. But before they could continue their world-shaking battle, they'd all freeze, feeling an absolutely enormous power level and a terrifying one at that. Frieza was on his way. Remember, Vegeta somehow picked up the ability to sense Ki naturally after leaving Earth, so in this case, I'm just going to say that he has guessed how to do it and hasn't honed the ability yet. But you don't need to be super accurate with Ki sense to tell that Frieza has a big ass power level. Vegeta then began to laugh and glow hysterically, thinking that Frieza must have been bored and wanted to see his victory against the low class Saiyans. But his laughter ended once he saw the huge supernova attack form over Frieza's spaceship and begin flying towards the planet. At this moment, Raditz, Vegeta, and Turles all realized the truth about the destruction of planet Vegeta. Frieza was here to finish off all the Saiyans at once. He really was afraid of the Super Saiyan legend. While the older three Saiyans sadly accepted their fate, Goku decided he would not accept this, and formed himself into the Kamehameha stands and began charging up the strongest one he could. Seeing this, Raditz and Turles decide to overcome their fear and join their younger brother, Raditz firing off a huge double Sunday, and Turles firing off his kill driver attack. Vegeta, lost in his despair, began to berate the low class Saiyans, saying there is no way they could even hope to stop that attack, until he saw Gohan, who was so hurt, stand up and fire off another Kamehameha with his family, having all four attacks mix and fire against the supernova attack. Knowing he could not let these low class Saiyans outdo him, his pride re-energized him, and he begrudgingly fought alongside them firing off the hugest Gallic gun he could into the beam. But right now, it's time for some quick math. Now, quick disclaimer, my math is most likely wrong, but I will be walking you through all of it. So, through some research into the Daizenshu books, I've determined that a Kamehameha must have a power level increase of 122%. That could be wrong, but for this video, we'll be using that. I'll be using that 122% as a base multiplier for all charged Keep Blasts. It's extremely possible that that's not the real multiplier for all the ones I'm going to name, but Goku and Gohan are using a Kamehameha in this instance, so that works for them. I've also rounded up all the power levels because I just wanted it to be a pretty even number. Other than that, I will show my math on screen. So, with this 122% increase, Goku goes to a 22,000 in power level, Raditz to a 27,000, Turles to an 18,000, and Vegeta to a 40,000. Gohan, interestingly enough, does get this 122% increase, but he does not go to 8,000. 
He also gets a rage boost because he's very angry in the situation. Now, rage boosts are kind of inconsistent because in the original timeline, Goku or Gohan, while fighting Raditz, goes from power level 1 to 1307. So that'd be a 1307 times increase, and that's way too big for this situation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it half a grade 8 multiplier, which is 10 times, and just make it 5 times. Which then bring Gohan to about 40,000 in power level. So altogether, this entire attack equals 147,000 in power level. Again, I will try and show all math on screen. I might be wrong. If I am, please do correct me. I have no problem with that. And back to the story. Even with all this effort exerted to repel the giant attack, all the Saiyans can do is buy themselves time. They're only delaying the inevitable. Once they can feel the heat of the giant attack, all the Saiyans will close their eyes and brace for impact. That is, until they'd find themselves on a completely new planet, Earth, and on the lookout, where a proud looking Kami was there, and they would then hear the voice of King Kai in their heads, telling them that they were welcome for the help. Once getting the bearings, Goku would be the only one to recognize where he and the other Saiyans found themselves. He would feel happy to know that he was home, but a startling realization comes upon him when Goku realizes that not only did they not beat Frieza, but now Vegeta and Nappa were here and in a position to take over the Earth. Goku and his Saiyan family try to get into a position to fight, but they're all much too tired to do anything more than sluggishly stand. Nappa is near paralyzed, and Vegeta is so exhausted physically and running so low on key that a key blast is impossible right now. Kami had already thought of this, however, and gives Goku a sensu bean as soon as he is able to, completely healing the Saiyan and giving him a pretty good Zenkai boost. Now with the ability to defeat the tired Vegeta easily, Goku convinces Kami to give everyone else with him sensu beans, and Kami relents having Mr. Popo go and ask Korn for more. While they wait, Kami tells Goku about what's been happening since he's been gone. Remember in part 3, there were 6 months of travel that I told you about that I would not be disclosing until this part. Kami then tells Goku that after Piccolo recovered from his attack from Raditz in part 1, he began fiercely training until he was strong enough to defeat even Raditz at that point in time. Then, after one year, he set out to conquer the planet, and he's been doing so for the last 6 months. The only person who could have stood up to him, Tien, has been defeated and killed, and is now on King Kai's planet training. Kami elaborates that Chiaotzu bravely tried to take Piccolo out with the self-destruction move, but it did nothing, which enraged Tien and caused him to lash out, and he was struck down quickly by Piccolo. This also means that there was no way to revive Chiaotzu, as he's already been revived once with the Dragon Balls on Earth. Goku sadly absorbs the information while Raditz is shocked. He was under the impression that he had killed the Namekian in part 1, but then Goku explains that Kami and Piccolo are connected. So if Piccolo had died, then Kami would have died as well, and there wouldn't have been anyone here to have wished them on Earth while they were fighting Frieza, so Ted they'd be dead too. Which earns him a slap in the head because Raditz is pretty flustered with that idea. Goku then decides it'd be best to go deal with Piccolo now, and after sensing his key, flies off in the direction of his power. Raditz, Charles, and Gohan are then given their sensor beams, and before really thinking, Gohan blasts off towards his home to go see his mother. Remember, he hadn't seen her for a year and a half. This leaves Kami in the awkward situation of being with the strong yet strange Saiyans. Raditz then bites the bullet and looks down at the Saiyan Prince with a scowl, and the two begin to talk about Frieza and what he planned to do. Vegeta is furious at the situation, and he realizes that he is in no position to really resist his opponents. So, he reveals his plan to become a Super Saiyan and take over the Tyrant's empire. Vegeta even reveals that he plans to create more Saiyan hybrids like Gohan, as the one Goku had as a low-class warrior seemed to be pretty damn powerful, so any child he had would be extremely powerful. Before Rats can even reply, King Kai blurts out in everyone's minds that under no circumstances should anyone try and take on Frieza. In fact, Raditz should try and take out Vegeta now and just live on Earth in peace. But as I've said many times in this series, Raditz is more prideful than he is in the original timeline. He's kind of a mixture of himself and Bardock almost, and decides that that would not work for him. He then looks down at Vegeta and cuts him a deal to join forces with the Saiyans and take on the Emperor. This is when Goku lands back on the lookout carrying an unconscious and battered Piccolo. So let's say Goku's income is about a 50% increase for him, taking him from a 10,000 to a 15,000. Piccolo in one year of training with Gohan went from 408 to 3,500, but it had to take a lot of time to actually train and toughen Gohan up. I mean the entire time went to spend on himself. So I'm actually going to double him up and bring Piccolo up to 7,000 in this timeline because the training he did in that year would have been all focused on him, which explains why he's able to take over the Earth so easily and why Goku so easily trounces him. Vegeta decides to accept Raditz's offer, and the two begin to plan a strategy to take on Frieza, much to the chagrin of a fiercely yelling King Kai and a sighing Kami. At this moment, Gohan lands back on the lookout with a guilty look carrying a vicious Chi Chi who pounces and begins berating Goku for his stupidity in taking her stun without even letting her know. 
While Goku deals with his angry wife, it's decided that the Saiyans would be allowed to train and take on Frieza as at some point Frieza could set his eyes on Earth or he'd become a bigger and bigger problem for the galaxy. Two things that neither King Kai or Kami want. It's also decided that Gohan will not be training with the other Saiyans as Chi Chi is still furious and wanting him to catch him on his studies, which really isn't a problem as he's been studying alien technology in space, but regardless. After this, Goku and the other Saiyans round up Piccolo, Vegeta, and Nappa as they're all still wounded and take them down to Couch Court where they'll be staying while Goku takes his family off to his home. Rats decides it's much better for the villains to stay hurt and heal slowly than heal quickly like the Saiyans would and get Zenkai boost and become problems again. Once home, Goku changes out of his tattered Saiyan armor back into one of his old geese and feels pretty great doing it. He offers Turles and Raditz one but they decline and say they'd be fine with their armor. Goku then points out that all their armors are pretty busted up now, but he also has the idea of taking them to Boma tomorrow to see if she could create them something like their armor, which they agree to. A few months after this, once everyone is healed up enough to do so, Goku and the others begin training hard. Even Piccolo joins in, seeing that all the Saiyans are much stronger than him, and if he ever wanted to take over the planet again, he'd have to surpass them. Goku, Turtles, and Raditz, as always, get along pretty well, but Vegeta and Nappa are on horrible terms now. Remember, Vegeta tried to kill Nappa after he failed him on that alien planet. And Piccolo just hates everybody, but they're all needed to make each other stronger. A few weeks into training, Goku has an epiphany and realizes that the growth right now is nowhere near fast enough to take on Frieza, so he goes to request from Kami to use the Ruling Spirit in time. After a bit of prodding, Kami allows this. Now the obvious choice for a person to go into the room with Goku would be Raditz, but I think Goku's gonna choose Vegeta instead. Piccolo and Nappa are nowhere strong enough, and Turles and Raditz are pretty good friends and would probably get some good training together. Goku could go in with either of them, but he's trained with them for a year before and probably wants something new and exciting. This also means he can have the strongest training partner possible and really push beyond his limits. That means that Telus and Raditz will go in together and Piccolo and Nappa will go last. Once in the time chamber, Vegeta and Goku go at it hard. Vegeta has little love for the younger Saiyan, other than a bit of respect he gained from seeing Goku take on Frieza without fear. Vegeta also gets pissed seeing that Goku's martial arts skills give him an edge in battle and starts to study them, picking them up very quickly. But slowly, even though they're doing the exact same training, Goku starts to overtake them. He starts getting stronger than Vegeta is at a quicker rate, and this causes Vegeta to push himself even harder than he ever has before just to stay in competition with Goku. And for the rest of their time in the chamber, I imagine this cycle of competition will continue for the two. So to understand how strong the two are going to get in the time chamber, we have to do some quick math. Goku is at a power level of 15,000 once entering the chamber, and Vegeta after his Zenkai boost in the Saiyan Saga was lit at around 24,000. They're trained together in the time chamber, so they're going to get a very big increase. Now remember, Goku got to 90,000 on his trip to Namek, which is only 6 days. The majority of that time was spent in 100 times Earth's gravity, and the room of spirit in time has a gravity of 10 times Earth's gravity. These are some of the factors you have to compute when you're doing this math. The timing also matches up pretty well. Remember, in this timeline, there was one year of training with the Saiyans by themselves, and then six months of travel to take on Vegeta and Nappa. This matches up with the normal timeline of one year of training to take on the Saiyans, and then six months of travel to get to Namek. So with the timelines, we need to determine what Goku's power was before leaving for Namek, which we really can't do as there isn't an official statement on it. But my guess would be around 12,000. If so, that's a 7.5 times increase from 12,000 to 90,000. But that was in 100 times gravity, and only over 6 days. So we're going to take those 6 days and divide 365 days, which is the amount of time Goku has in the time chamber, and get the equivalent. We then get 60.83 repeating, so for simplicity's sake, we'll round that up to 61. We'll then apply our 7.5 times multiplier over 61 days and we get 457.5, which will round up to 456. But we'll also divide this 456 by 10, because this isn't 100 times gravity, but only 10 times gravity. So we end up with 45.6, which will round up to 46, so we can apply a 46 times multiplier to everyone now. That multiplier puts Goku at 690,000 from just the time chamber, and it would actually put Vegeta at 1,104,000. But there's nothing to consider here. Goku is shown as having more potential than Vegeta at this point. It was due to Toriyama's bad power scaling, but a Zenkai boost took Goku from 90,000 to 3 million. That's a really huge increase, so I'm going to give Goku what I like to call a plot boost because Dragon Ball. Originally, he got a 33.3 times increase from that Zenkai, and I don't just want to overpower Goku, so we'll give him a 3 times increase and put him at 2 million. 
Goku doesn't let Vegeta in on the fact that he's actually stronger than him, and he only gives him the impression that they're about equal by suppressing most of his power at the time. Once emerging, Vegeta and Goku shock everyone with their power, and Raditz and Turles are raring to go after getting over their shock and climbing the chamber themselves. We then apply another 46 times increase, and Turles was at 8,250 and Raditz was at 12,000, so they're now at 379,500 and 552,000 respectively. Now remember, all this training takes place over the course of one day, and the people outside the chamber aren't just going to sit around. During Goku and Vegeta's training, Gohan takes the opportunity to introduce his mother to his uncles, and Chi-Chi is shocked to see how much Turles resembles Goku, but she doesn't really care. She isn't really going to like them seeing as how they convince Goku to take Gohan into space with them, and she begins yelling at them, which answers the question in Raditz's mind of why Kakarot was attracted to the woman. Raditz then remembers his desire to begin creating more Saiyan hybrids, and he interrupts Chi-Chi's tirade to begin asking her how Goku took her as a mate. This pisses her off even more, and she explains that on Earth they have something called romance. This idea confuses and intrigues Raditz, and he begins asking more and more questions. He then looks down at Gohan and tells him to bring him other females like his mother on this planet. Chi Chi, however, shuts that idea down and opts to accompany the two and introduce them to the rest of the Z Fighters. So, Chi Chi, Gohan, Raditz, and Turles, who would rather just stay on the lookout and train, head towards a still standing Kame house. Chi Chi explains that Piccolo's six month reign was pretty pitiful. According to Chi Chi, he apparently just went to a TV station, announced himself as king, and only took on a few people. There was some destruction to enforce his rule, but other than that, it didn't go too far as red. They make it to Kame House and find Krillin and Yamcha training with Master Roshi fiercely, only to be shocked when they land. Gohan has to calm Krillin and Yamcha down and explain the situation to everybody inside. Everyone is relieved to know that Piccolo has been defeated, and by Goku no less. Knowing that Goku is back home gives them all a sense of relief though they tense back up knowing that there's an even bigger bad guy out there in space. Raditz notices Launch and thinks she's pretty cute, but noticing how meek she is, he kind of disregards her until he sees her fiery blonde form and yeah, dude falls in love. The Saiyans spend the rest of the day at Kame House learning about the Earthlings and their customs. Raditz learns more about Tien and Chiaotzu and the limitation of the Dragon Balls not being able to bring Chiaotzu back, and he begins to think about the Namekian homeworld and maybe having something similar. He suggests this to the group, which gives them all hope, but secretly, he begins to consider using the Dragon Balls to revive the rest of the Saiyans. This actually brought up a pretty good question for me while writing the script. In Dragon Ball, what counts as dying in combat? We see that people are brought back all the time and they really didn't even fight the villain that killed them, so I'm kinda curious, does it count for the Saiyans as dying in combat when really all that happened was King Vegeta and Bardock fought him and the Saiyans just ended up dying by an attack that Frieza threw at them? Does that count as them dying in combat or no? Let me know what you think, and I'll probably put a poll up in the iCard right there. Back to the story, the next day when Goku and Vegeta exit the time chamber and Raditz and Turles jump in, Goku and Vegeta begin to spar and show off in front of everybody. After this, Bulma flies up onto the lookout on one of her jets, looking for Raditz. She wants to ask him, Kami, or Piccolo more about the Namekian homeworld if they really thought there were Dragon Balls there, but she'd be disappointed to find that Raditz was in the time chamber and wouldn't be out for a day, Piccolo was unwilling to give her any information, and Kami just didn't know any. Vegeta then yells at her and tells her to go away, which puts the two of them into an argument. Mr. Purple, however, steps in and takes Boma with him to discuss more about Planet Namek, and he even shows her Kami's old ship. Boma then comes back and relays the information that there is a ship that could be used to go to Namek and maybe find Dragon Balls to revive Tien and Chiaotzu. This makes Vegeta realize something. The Saiyans don't have a ship. The only one on Earth right now is the old Namekian ship, and it'd be much too slow for Vegeta's taste. Boma then offers to just build the Saiyans a new ship by reverse engineering Kami's ship. That way, both groups can go about their quest at the same time. Vegeta just scoffs and doesn't believe this idea will work. This lights a fire under Boma, and she bets Vegeta that she can not only make a faster ship than the Namek ship, but do so in a month. And if she wins, Vegeta has to wear whatever she says when he goes to fight Frieza. And if he wins, then she'll let him take him out on a date. At the end of the day, Raditz and Turles exit the time chamber, a bit myth that they hadn't caught up to Goku and Vegeta, and resolve to go back in another day before they leave for space. Nappa and Piccolo are extremely eager to get into the time chamber, but once in, Piccolo sets his new plan to motion. He is by no means good in this timeline. In fact, he's much worse than what he was in the original, because he's had no interaction with Gohan. Realizing he would have to use his wits to take out the Saiyans and take over Earth, no, the universe, because now he knows about Frieza and the Space Empire, he decides that he needs to get Nappa on his side. Now, Nappa's had a Zenkai, so I'd put him at maybe 9,000 or 10,000, and Piccolo's still at 7,000. Remember that Dai Zenshu lists Nappa as a 4,000, but he got Goku, who is at 8,000, a bit higher, to use Kaioken. So, Nappa is stronger than listed. With a 46 times multiplier, they'll go from 300, or they'll go to 322,000 and 368,000 respectively. 
In the chamber, Piccolo begins to manipulate Nappa into his plot. The big saying isn't the sharpest tool in the shed, and at the moment, he really doesn't have any loyalty to anyone. Vegeta tried to kill him, and he hates the low-class Saiyan, and the pitiful humans. His only real shared goal right now is to make sure that Frieza dies for his betrayal of the Saiyan race. Piccolo then convinces Nappa that he would serve him in his quest to take over the universe, stroking Nappa's ego and getting him to agree. The two spend the rest of their time training and strategizing in the Room of Spirit and Time. Once they exit, Raditz and Turtles hop back into the time chamber and Piccolo and Nappa are noticeably more buddy-buddy. Goku and Vegeta spend their time relaxing and training from time to time, with Vegeta spending a lot of his time at Castle Court to antagonize Bulma. Raditz and Turtles, once they exit, don't get the same 46 times increase. They wouldn't benefit from the effects of the time chamber after they had acclimated to it in their first year. So, I'm only going to give them a 2 times increase because it's been 1 year of training in 10 times gravity. It isn't too beneficial to them. So this will bring them to Raditz in the low millions and Turles just short at 736,000. Piccolo and Nappa go back in one more day as well to get a bit more training in and iron out their plan. They come out with the same 2 times increase end up at 700,000 and Piccolo at 600,000. After this, everyone decides to rate the rest of the month for Bulma to finish her ship in time. It's decided that Yamcha and Krillin would accompany Bulma to Namek for protection, while Gohan protests that he should go as well, and his mother finally relents and allows him to go. The whole group is surprised when Piccolo offers to go as well. Kami for one doesn't trust his motives but relents as there's not much he can do to stop him. Fast forward a month and both groups are ready to blast off in space with the Saiyans having an even faster ship than the Namek team. This is something I forgot to mention in that video, but Turles actually decided he would go with the Namek team to keep Piccolo in line and maybe sneak some training with Gohan as he was not allowed to train on Earth then. But other than that, Goku and his group decide that they are going straight to the heart of Frieza's empire to strike back. Now for this part, we'll be focusing on Goku's team. We'll chat back in with Momo's crew next part. Goku, Raditz, Vegeta, and Nappa at the moment were traveling to where Vegeta said the true home of Frieza was. Anytime we see Frieza in the series, he's usually in his mothership, but we never really see him resting on a planet or some type of space station that he would really call his home. So my creation in this scenario is that Frieza and King Cold have some type of resting spot where the majority of their forces stay, and they just relax there. Vegeta, once in the capsule court ship, changes out of the pink uniform that he would have had to wear since he lost the bet to Bulma. And remember, he is the one who commissioned this ship from Bulma, not Goku. Therefore, he did not ask her or her father to make a gravity machine like Goku would have. During the entire trip, Goku and Vegeta desperately want to spar, but they know it'd be pretty tame. So, Goku comes up with the idea of teaching Vegeta how to do image training, and the two just sit there for hours, fighting without throwing one punch. Raditz spends most of his time strategizing. At this point, he is under the impression that they can all kill Frieza with little effort, because Goku and Vegeta are around twice the power of his first form, and they don't know that he can transform yet. Raditz finds Vegeta to be the bigger threat, as he's thinking of ways to take him on afterwards, as Goku and Vegeta are almost equal in power, or so Raditz believes. Goku's been hiding some power, from his potential being a bit higher than Vegeta's around this time in the original timeline. Raditz realizes that if Goku were to lose to Vegeta, they would not be able to defeat him, and while Nappa was openly against Vegeta, he was not for Raditz and Goku. So Raditz has to come up with some type of idea that would allow him to kill both Vegeta and Nappa after they had beaten Frieza. Now, I imagine wherever Frieza's base would be, it would be pretty deep in space, and while the Capsule Corp ship is extremely fast, it would take them some time. Let's say about a month or so, Though Goku and Vegeta's image training is not enough for them. Raditz is strategizing and Nappa is just brooding in the corner. They're all getting pretty pent up. Vegeta, thinking he's the pseudo leader of this group, realizes this and he thinks to himself that it would be very beneficial for them to stretch their legs a bit. I imagine this is kind of the Vegeta that we get in the Android saga. He's in that anti-hero stage where he will never admit that he kind of likes Goku or Raditz or any of them, but he's not openly trying to fight against them. His corruption of good has kind of happened from Goku and Bulma. Vegeta decides that on the way they can make little detours and destroy Frieza owned planets to piss the Emperor off. Goku, however, shuts that down, at least the destruction of the planets part, and tells Vegeta that he plans to do that, that they might as well have their fight now. Vegeta does consider this as it's a pretty good idea, but he concedes this to Goku, and they compromise that they would eliminate all the Frieza forces on the planet. That way, they can get some time to stretch their legs, and they piss Frieza off. It's a win for both of them. So we get these scenes of the Saiyans running out to Frieza planets and taking on the Frieza forces. Goku, Raditz, Nappa, and Vegeta. And Raditz realizes how ironic it is that now he and his little brother are working with Vegeta to take down Frieza. This is the dynamic for the few weeks of travel. And finally, they reach their destination and find a huge wall of Frieza soldiers out waiting for them in front of the space station. Vegeta, still taking up his leadership role, decides that they wouldn't hide their power levels completely and leave them lower 
then the power of Frieza's first form, around 100 to 200,000. Enough to make Frieza throw his soldiers out, but be relaxed enough to simply sit back and watch the carnage. Raditz didn't love this idea, but he knows that Vegeta really wants to screw with Frieza, and he does love that idea. Now, I imagine Frieza's ship can make some kind of artificial atmosphere for his soldiers when they fight in space, because of this scene in the Bardart special. Granted, this could be that the atmosphere of planet Vegeta just reaches out so far that Bardock can still breathe, but I'm just going to say that in some way, there is some type of artificial atmosphere being created by Frieza's ship, because we've never been confirmed that all the other Frieza forces can survive in space like Frieza can. So, that's happening here on the space station, and as long as the Saiyans stay within that area, they can basically fight in space. Seeing their targets, Goku, Raditz, Vegeta, and Nappa fly from their ship and into the army and begin tearing through them like a thousand degree knife through butter. Vegeta takes an extreme catharsis in this with all the payback, especially when he sees people like Queen easily blast him into oblivion. Nappa is getting a similar happiness from all this carnage, but continues waiting for the right moment to implement the plan that he and Piccolo had made. While Goku and Raditz are just enjoying the fight and waiting for their chance to hit Frieza. Raditz in the back of his head though is starting to think that this is way too easy. And this idea is confirmed for him once he sees Captain Ginyu appear in front of Goku with Guldo and stab him so through the chest with a hand, right before Guldo activates his time stop. Guldo moves over and tries to pin Goku down so he'd be hit by the change now being. But this all backfires as soon as time resumes because Goku has ample time to move. Remember, this Goku has a max power level of 2 million, so he'd be much faster than the beam would actually hit him. He reaches down, grabs Guldo by the head, and throws him into the beam, ruining Ginyu's plan. The two Ginyu Force members then look on in horror seeing Vegeta literally ram straight through Raccoon and Nappa obliterating the tag team of Burner and Jace as well as a big group of Frieza's surrounding soldiers with his volcano explosion attack. Vegeta then notices them and looks over with a very cruel smirk, which was the last thing they saw before he blew them away with a blast. With the Ginyu Force completely obliterated, Frieza frowns and sets down his wand, sighing as he realizes that he must now intervene. A hatch in his station opens and he floats out in his chair, flanked by Zarbon and Dodoria. Vegeta notices them and begins yelling and gloating to Frieza about revenge for the Saiyan race and how he had finally become the legendary Super Saiyan that he knew Frieza feared. Frieza simply rolls his eyes in exasperation at this and simply raises a finger to blow Vegeta away with a supernova. Vegeta only smirks at this and waits for the attack, the other Saiyans paying rapt attention to him now. Frieza throws the attack and mows down the soldiers too slow or too stupid to avoid it. Frieza is especially shot when the attack doesn't destroy Vegeta, but instead, Vegeta holds against it, pressing back and trying to resist it, before yelling and hurling it straight up into the air, where it explodes harmlessly, and he begins to laugh in Frieza's face. Vegeta begins to tease and yell at Frieza as he starts to slowly power up to his full power level of 1,104,000, destroying any scouters that were previously intact. Frieza and Zarbon are not scared at all, but Frieza does relent and compliment Vegeta on growing this powerful, even though it would not serve him at all with such feeble power before he blasts Dodorio away for fleeing out of fear. He then begins to grow and morph into his second form, which blows Vegeta and the rest of the Saiyans away, as they know that this form isn't too far above Vegeta's power level. Vegeta not being scared about this, and really enjoying the idea of a even fight, plows into the Emperor in his huge form, and the two begin to wage absolute war on each other, which causes any of the remaining soldiers to flee from the awesome power of the two and Zarbon morphs into his monster form and begins killing the deserters. Zarbon's job didn't last very long though, as he's blasted away by Raditz, which freed up the rest of the Saiyans to watch the battle, with Goku extremely bored and anxious while watching. Freeze, on the other hand was growing sick and tired of being nearly even with Vegeta, and Vegeta's much better martial arts from his training with Goku in the Room Spirit in Time was quickly allowing him to get more and more critical and painful hits on the Emperor. Freeza scoffs at the idea, but is pushed back into transforming into his third form. Once he announces it though, Vegeta is nowhere near as shocked, and he begins to attack Frieza while he's transforming, blasting and beating him, but Frieza's growing power made these hits thud and barely hurt. Once he had finally transformed completely, he grinned his new form, and began to absolutely torture Vegeta with the crazy finger beam technique, not knocking the pants out of the fight. Goku now realizes that it's his turn to take on Frieza, and zooms in to do so, surprising the others as he reveals that he's actually much stronger than he's been letting on. Goku has a max power level of 2,070,000 and most power levels I see for third form Frieza place him around 1.8 million to 2 million. So let's say that he's about 1.8 million and he's put in the same position he was in with Vegeta only moments earlier. But now things are much worse for him. Goku's martial arts are better and his power level is higher. Frieza grows bored of taking this beating very quickly and goes Goku and letting him transform to his true state, which Goku agrees to, wanting a much better fight than what he's getting. 
Raditz, however, is having none of this and flies in to attack the Emperor himself. But with Goku laying off him, all Freeze has to do is sit there and transform, and none of the hits that Raditz is giving him are really doing much. Nappa, while onlooking the battle, realizes that this is the perfect chance for him to implement his plan. Vegeta is down, Goku is attracted while watching Frieza transform, and Raditz is doing everything he can to stop the transformation. He won't be getting a better shot, so he flies back to the Capsule Corp ship and flees as stealthily as he can, ignoring the curse of Vegeta, who was the only one to notice him leaving. Vegeta weakly raised a hand and tried to shoot one key blast to stop Nappa from fleeing, but he was slowly losing consciousness and ended up missing. He cursed the final time and focused back in on the fight with Goku, Raditz, and Frieza and realized that Frieza had completed his transformation, and was now taking on the two low-class Saiyans that he had held such contempt for. He saw them taking on Frieza, and this strange mixture of pride and jealousy began to overtake him. Goku and Raditz were beginning to panic, as Frieza was slowly ramping up his power, now at 5% and easily dominating the two. But Raditz, thinking fast, puts his hands to his head and uses one of the techniques that Goku had taught him during their training on planet Frieza number 79. He yells out Solar Flare and blinds the Emperor, he then looks to Goku in a hurry and tells him to go ahead and use the sensu beams like they planned so they could get a Zenkai boost. But before he reached for his, he felt a dull pain and began to hack up blood, only to look down and see a gaping hole through his chest. Staggering back, he looked at the culprit, a bored looking King Cold, scowling at his son as Frieza yelled about his eyes. Once he had recovered, King Cold began to chastise Frieza for wasting so much time and raised a hand to use a death beam on Goku, who barely noticed the pain for all the anger and rage flooding him at seeing Raditz done down. This began to make Goku shake and tremble with rage, drawing Cold and Frieza's attention to him. As Raditz fell back, bleeding out worse than Vegeta was, he ended up pretty close to the prince, and he reached down to his armor to pull out the sensor beam he had snuck off Earth, thankful that it hadn't been destroyed by Cold's blast. Raditz slowly began to make the move to chomp down on him, but he paused and looked at Vegeta, who was now nearly in tears from all the pain and anger and jealousy flooding his system. He shook his head as he reached out, and put the bean in the other Saiyan's hand. He hacked and coughed up more blood, grovelling something about how he had a much better chance of helping out his brother. Raditz implored him to finally finish off this damn war that their fathers began, and passes off, leaving a shock for Jita. But the situation only grew more chaotic and intense as Goku roared out, covered in a deep golden ore with his eyes blanked and his hair raised. Frieza began to wonder if that Super Saiyan legend they had been talking about so long was really true, but Cold wasting no time began to blast at the Saiyan growling. Now, here's one of the things that I think you guys may not agree with me in, and if you don't, that's perfectly fine. In this what if though, I'm going to say that King Cold could not transform. My theory is that it's not possible for him. My number one reason is that if he could, future Goku wouldn't have been able to beat him, as strong as he was. In the manga, it's stated that he's about as strong as Mecha Frieza in the form we saw him in. So, if transformation was possible for him, that would render him stronger, and therefore, he would have killed Goku, not the heart virus. Number two, there's an interview where Toriyama says, if Cold had the ability to transform, his final form would be about as strong as semi-perfect cell. But that was an if, not a confirmation that he can transform. Number three, Frieza's forms aren't transformations like Super Saiyan forms. He doesn't get stronger by adding some type of multiplier. They're actually suppressions, so he doesn't constantly destroy things when out of battle. With that line of logic, if Cold's resting stage is like Frieza's second stage, that would mean that he has less power to limit, which makes no sense as he's supposed to be as strong as Mecha Frieza. Finally, in number four, well just finally, Store Ray probably would have decided to revive King Cold over Frieza because he makes statements showing that he knows that Goku beat Boo, so he'd know he's stronger. Now again, if you don't agree, that's perfectly fine, but just know that I've decided that in this what if, King Cold cannot transform. He is locked in the form that we see him in, except he's extremely strong. Now back to the story. Goku in this false Super Saiyan state would probably only be getting a 25 times multiplayer applier or so. This puts him around a 50 million power level at the moment, and Frieza, still angry at the Saiyans, wanted to continue toying with them, but was cut off by his father, wanting him to just destroy them. Frieza sighs and was about to do so, but was interrupted when Vegeta, fresh off his Zenkai boost, plows right through him, attacking him away and distracting Cold long enough for Goku to do the same to him. Now, Vegeta around this time was getting Zenkai boots that were very strong, but they weren't the same as Goku's. The Zenkai he got after fighting Ragoon put him around 250,000, and when he fought Frieza, he was around 500,000. When he fought Frieza's final form, he would have had to been around 2 million or so. So, let's mix those two Zenkais together and give him a 2 times boost. This puts him at a base power level of 4 million. And Vegeta at the moment was raging. He could feel the massive power come from Goku, and was under the impression, like Frieza was, 
But that was what a Super Saiyan was. And it was nowhere near what they needed to win. So much had happened in such a short time that it just supercharged his emotions. Nappa, who was supposed to be an elite, had betrayed them and fled. Though Raditz and Goku, who were supposed to be the low class, had showed so much Saiyan pride and gumption in fighting Frieza head on. Raditz, who openly hated him, had even sacrificed himself to give Vegeta another shot. And Goku was still fighting for his life and using what he believed to be the Super Saiyan power. And what's worse, Goku got there first. Not to mention, the legend still wasn't enough to beat Frieza. Vegeta was angry. Vegeta was furious. And it all coalesced in this amazing surge of power. Finally, he roared out and in a huge flash of golden light, became a true Super Saiyan with a power level of 200 million. Cole was then distracted from his manhandling of Goku, whose unstable Super Saiyan form had worn off. He saw the huge flash of light and looked over to see a golden-haired Vegeta dominating Frieza in his full power state. Cole realized that Frieza was in extreme danger, tried to blast Goku into oblivion, but was stopped when Goku reached into his gi like Raditz had done before him and produced a sensu beam, chopping down on it and getting a Zenkai boost and flashing into the same state of Vegeta. Now Goku got almost 34 times stronger from the Zenkai he got after fighting Captain Ginyu, but I've already given him a bit of a plot boost from that Zenkai. So the boost he'll be getting here will be half that, at 17 times. That puts Goku's base power level at 34 million, and when in Super Saiyan form, an insane 1.7 billion, which Vegeta takes ample notice of. With this new power, Goku begins to easily overpower and beat down on Cold. Knowing there is absolutely no way he and Vegeta can lose, he prepares to tell Cold to take Frieza and leave. But he stops, and he thinks about Raditz, and his father who Raditz had told him about, and even Tarlis and Gohan. He realizes he couldn't face them if he let Frieza and his father live. With a cruel and serious look, he throws King Cold into Frieza, stopping Vegeta from wailing on the young Emperor, and tells Vegeta that it's time the Saiyans give the demons a taste of their own medicine. Vegeta wants to argue, but he can think of nothing more fitting than the Saiyans blasting these two into oblivion. So he flies beside Goku and begins to charge up the attack that he'd been thinking of during their image training that he was going to call the Final Flash. Well, Goku drops into the Kamehameha stand. King Cold and Frieza begin to panic, but Cold, thinking quick and dirty, decides to blast the space station, which was creating the artificial atmosphere that the Saiyans are using to breathe, and begins to blow up, making the air the Saiyans breathe start to disappear. But well, Vegeta and Goku grit their teeth and let their blast fly, blasting Cold and Frieza away completely. And the two are horrified as they see ghosts of the Saiyans that they had killed behind the two, as if the entire race had opened up hell, climbed out just to drag him down there with them. There would be no coming back. With no time to waste, Vegeta realized that their own fight would have to wait till later, and struggles to breathe to tell Goku to follow him into the exploding space station to get space pods and fly out of there. They do so with little time to waste and climb in pods, not even changing the preset coordinates, which I will leave as yard draft. The two just barely escape the blast and pass out from barely being able to breathe the entire time. The last thing we see is Nappa and the Capsule Corp ship flying towards planet Nim with a smirk. And that plus with the fam is we'll be leaving this timeline off for now. Yes, I know this one is a bit far fetched, but this is just the idea I had for this part. I wanted the war and conclusion of the Frieza arc to be as cathartic as possible for the Sands. I'm also leaving the plan that Nappa and Piccolo have come up with pretty barren until next part, because a lot of Nappa's actions in this part won't be explained till then. Over with Bowman and her squad, let's say that about five months and three weeks have passed into their journey towards Namek, when suddenly they are telepathically contacted by King Kai, who then reveals what happened with Goku and his team, the sad death of Raditz and the betrayal of Nappa. King Kai explains that he had waited so long to tell them because he wanted to know exactly where Nappa was going first and didn't want them to be irrational once they got to Namek, saying that they could just wish Raditz back once they had gotten there. And he actually wanted Raditz to be the one to tell them this, but he hadn't made it to his planet yet. This was strange as King Yemen had told King Kai that Raditz would be allowed to keep his body and that he had already set off down Snake Way, so he reckoned that he was just taking his sweet time. For now though, they needed to know that Nappa had landed on planet Namek and began terrorizing the planet, collecting the Dragon Balls, and surprisingly, he had been taking active steps not to kill any Namekians. Hearing this, Piccolo, who had been meditating, can't help but smirk hearing his plan being followed. Luckily, nobody noticed it though. Gohan and Turles noticeably have a total change in demeanor, Gohan's being actually visible, while Turles almost seems to be leaking killing intent. Somehow, just knowing that Nappa had survived 
while rats had to sacrifice himself, just brings their blood to a boiling point. It makes one thing clear, Nappa was going to get slaughtered for his betrayal, and the rest of the trip took place in relative silence. A week later, the group land on Namek, and before much could be said about a game plan, Turles and Gohan stand up and fly from the ship, set on finding their prey. Before they got too far, Turles actually stopped mid-flight and grabbed Gohan by the head, telling him to go back with the others. Gohan hearing this order almost loses it at his pseudo-uncle for denying him the same revenge that Turles himself was about to indulge in. But never being one to easily express his feelings, Turles growled back that it wasn't a request and that Gohan was too weak before shooting off leaving Gohan to scoff and fly back to the ship with the others. While conducting his search for Nappa, Turles thinks inwardly. He was very glad that he had sent Gohan back. He didn't want him to turn out like he or Raditz used to be. Plus, he didn't want to be chewed out by Chi-Chi for showing her son something so gory. Back with Gohan, when the young hybrid had rejoined Bulma's group, she had activated the Dragon Radar, and Krillin tried to console him. But Gohan offers little thanks, though I will say that he is starting to warm up to Krillin and the others. Piccolo scoffs at the behavior and gets in telepathic contact with Nappa, who was a bit freaked out at first, but calms down after a while. He warns him that Turles is after him and that he'll need to stay on the move and keep his power level hidden. He also warns that the Earthlings have a device that can sense the Dragon Ball, so he needs to hide them somewhere so he can move undetected. And he needs to remember not to kill any Namekians, as any of them could be tied to the Dragon Balls, and if they were to die, the Dragon Balls would be inert, ruining their plan. Now hearing all these orders, Nappa roars back at the Namekian to remember who is the boss here, and to show some respect. He goes off with this whole tirade about being a Saiyan elite and respect, and Piccolo just simply cuts off contact for now. On the Dragon Radar, Bulma notes that six of the Dragon Balls were actually together, and one was off in the lone direction by itself. Krillin says that since Turles flew closer to the cluster, that must be where Nappa was, and since he wouldn't be needing help, they should go get the one by itself. The rest agree, and Yamcha scoots up Bomo, who seems less than thrilled about that. The group of five actually blast off towards Guru's house at full speed. They make it there in a few hours, and Piccolo having on and off contact with Nappa all the way through. Nappa reveals that he had buried the balls and been on the move ever since, leading Turtles on a wild goose chase. Once there, they find a few Namekians, not the hundred or so that King Kai had told them about, but maybe a good 12 or so. They all look frightened at holding inside the house, as Bone begins to speak for the group, and some of the Namekian that Mr. Popo had taught her. She says that they come in peace, and after hearing that these intruders meant no harm, one voice called out over the others to her, and said that she was the weakest of the strangers, and to come in. To her credit, Boba actually bravely does so without much of a thought, not really seeing the danger in a situation like this. A few minutes later, the same voice calls out saying that everyone but the evil Namekian could come inside. They enter while Piccolo growls, and Gruul begins to explain more about the situation, the conversation is halted about 5 minutes later though, when a massive power is was approaching, and the group wonders if it were Nappa, before it that the key was much too pure hearted to be him. Their answer is given when they hear a voice outside, yelling about how such an evil Namekian even existed, and why he was here. Guru then yells out in a classic, NAIL, and calls him inside, telling him to ignore the impure one, and say hello to their guests. This Namekian walks in, and respectfully asks the Grand Elder to please refer to him as Gas, as he was neither Nail or the three Namekian warriors that had fused to take on Nappa. Guru then expresses that he was still unhappy with that choice, and informs him that the visitors had already planned on getting rid of this menace, and in return would be allowed to use the Dragon Balls. Gas then begins to look over the Earthlings, and asking his own questions, and after a while, the other Namekians in the home begin to relax and conversate, still seeing cooler Piccolo outside though. Speaking of Piccolo, outside he was currently in telepathic contact with Nappa, giving him directions, and soon he gives him a signal they had been waiting for, and yelled into his mind, NOW. Just then the roof of Guru's house was blown apart, and the huge head of Nappa took the Dragon Ball on top of Guru's chair, as well as one of the young Namekians that had been too close to the chair. The booming laugh of the brute could be heard as he flew off, not even thinking to hide his power any longer. Piccolo could then be heard outside cursing, and a thud from him dropping his weights before he as well zoomed off after his silent partner. Gas falling close behind them, Gohan, Krillin, and Yamcha deciding they should also go as well, but they are frozen when Guru coughs out for them to wait as he has something that would help them. Piccolo hot of the trail of Nappa was roaring at him in his mind for going off the plan. He wasn't supposed to take a Namekian, and Nappa calculates back into his mind that it would be the end of their partnership, and cuts off contact. Before Piccolo could do anything else, Gas flies alongside him and yells out that if the evil Namekian had something to do with this, he would kill him, and the two are then interrupted by the sight of Turles zooming past them, causing them both all to focus and fly faster. A while later, Nappa lands where he hit in the Dragon Balls and throws the young Namekian to the ground. He then digs up the Dragon Balls and tells the kid to summon the dragon, but before the kid could, a dark blue and black blur plowed into the back of the massive sand, roaring out that this was for Raditz. In part 4, we put Nappa at around 740,000 and Turles at about 760,000, so I'm going to say that that 20,000 difference does make Turles stronger, but it's not a cakewalk of a fight for him. 
The two Saiyans begin brawling as Piccolo and Gast arrive, while Piccolo hangs back to further assess the situation. Gast flies in to help defeat the menace that had been terrorizing his planet. He's shocked, however, when Turtles rears on him, knocking him away and telling him to stay out of this fight. This further angers the Super Namekian. He begins fighting against both Saiyans, while Piccolo, seeing a chance to stick him out on top, smirks and says about a new plan. By the time Gohan, Krillin, and Yamcha all arrive with their new power unlocked by Guru, Nappa, Turtles, Gas, and Piccolo are in a huge brawl, all taking shots at each other, while a young Namekian quivers in fear and runs to them, recognizing them from Gurus. Krillin tells Yamcha and Gohan that they should grab the Dragon Balls, while the others are distracted and get the kid back to Gurus. But Gohan, finally sick of being told what to do, barrels into the fight. Yamcha and Krillin curse at the boy's impetuousness and fly in to at least help him. Gohan could feel his power slowly growing in him, but he still wasn't enough to play in this huge battle. He gets knocked away by a punch that someone had decided to dodge and reels in pain, looking up to see Krillin and Yamcha at his side. Gohan snarls and tries to fly back into the battle, but then a power they had recently interpreted as Piccolo's begins to rise, even higher than everyone there, and the eyes of those in the battle widen as a second Piccolo flies from behind the huge rock that the battle had been taking place by and yells out Special Beam Cannon, releasing the attack towards the cluster of fighters. Nappa for one avoided this attack by pushing gas into it and dodging to the side, while Turles understands what's happening and pushes Krillin, Gohan, and the others out of the way of the attack as he and Gast are drilled through the chest by it. The Saiyan and Super Namekian both thud to the ground, almost dead. Turles actually does pass on fairly quickly, while Gast begins trying to slowly heal the huge hole in his chest. Gohan was frozen. After being pushed to the side by his uncle and watching him pass on, he began to growl and snarl and tremble in rage. Meanwhile, Nap could be heard chuckling obnoxiously and congratulating Piccolo, saying that since he had helped him out, they could team back up. He somehow ignores the fact that Piccolo had also tried to do him in with the same attack as Piccolo emerged with his multiform technique. Before Piccolo could reply to anything, they both look over shocked to see Gohan roaring out in rage as his hair is constantly shifting from his natural black to a bright blonde and his power is shifting and increasing and decreasing very rapidly. Now in part 3, Gohan was at a 35,000 power level. Let's say that he did get a Zenkai boost from the big bean trunk with Frieza and give him a 1.33 times boost. That would round him up to about 47,000. Now he's only received the initial boost from Guru, so that will put him at a power level of 43,851. Remember, it works on a slow release of power. And adding on to that, the Super Saiyan multiplier appearing and disappearing at any given moment has his power between 44,000 to 2.2 million. Gohan roars out a beastly roar of anger and drives in Nappa, more angry at him than Piccolo. Nappa is put on the defensive, having to block some of the blows and feeling the power of some of them to be much less than some of the others. He knows that this power also reminds him of the power that he felt spike up when he was fleeing the battle with Frieza. It had to be Super Saiyan. After having one of his arms almost broken from blocking one of the kid's punches, Nappa finally sees his hair fade to black and aims a hard punch right into his opponent's neck, making a loud crack ring out. Gohan then falls to the ground, almost paralyzed, and Krillin and Yamcha yell out in horror and fly back in to attack Nappa, who was having a bit more trouble with them since he only really had one arm and their power was still growing like Gohan's was. Piccolo had been completely stunned, this absolutely massive increase in power, and the kid was still getting stronger and stronger, only for Gohan to still fall to Nappa. He then felt a hand grab him around the leg and looked down as he gasped, struggling to heal himself. The warrior Namekian scowled and began to curse at Piccolo, roaring out to him. Gas reveals that he could not allow Namekian as evil as Piccolo to persist in this world, and that he would activate a truly forbidden technique, Force Namekian Assimilation. Piccolo is taken aback and still in reeling of shock in this. Gas explains that with the fusion of four pure-hearted warrior Namekians, they would dilute his evil and allow them to defeat Nappa. Piccolo completely rejects this and tries to get away, but Gas did not introduce this as a suggestion and is able to force the fusion to take place, attempting to make himself the host. Nappa and the humans stop their skirmish, looking over in horror as a bright light appeared around Piccolo, and his power skyrocketed. Now Gas was about 14.77 times stronger than Nail, and because this fusion is very rough and not consensual between the two parties, and they're all fighting for control of good and evil, the power is kind of struggling and shifting a bit. So I'm only going to award Piccolo a boost of 15 times right now. That puts Piccolo at 9.6 million. His power could increase the more control he gets over this fusion though. The amazing power of this new being shocked everyone. What scared them the most was the familiarity of this power and a smirk that only Piccolo could muster before he pointed at Nappa and the large saint exploded. Piccolo then chuckled that that was returning on him and laughs harder at the fact that Gas Plan had backfired on him. He hysterically begins to cheer about his newfound power, feeling a hive of a plan coming together even if it had been derailed a bit. He then looks to Krillin and Yamcha, and then down to the slowly breathing heat that used to be Gohan. 
as if considering something, before smirking and telling them to make sure that Gohan didn't die. He was very interested in him. Piccolo then turned his back on them and began using telekinesis to float the all seven Dragon Balls towards him, and in perfect Mechian, began to speak, summoning Purunga forth. Krillin and Yamcha don't even consider trying to fight. Piccolo had grown way too strong. They simply scoop up Gohan and the young Namekian and fly out towards Gurus at full speed. At first, Piccolo shows a bit of indecisiveness, his thoughts and other influences running through his mind, but Purunga hurries him forward. Piccolo simply snorts in frustration and makes his first wish. Make the Namekian known as Kami immortal. This was to make sure that Kami couldn't take him down by taking himself down. A bit of insurance to assure that his rule wasn't brought to an end through cheap chicks. Now what else could he wish for? His original plan had been to also make himself immortal, but now that wasn't so appealing. It could have had something to do with the influence of those other Namekians. Wait. Yes, that was a very good wish. He then looks up to Perungo and communicates in Namekian his last two wishes, and soon he hears clapping behind him. He turns to see a Namekian that resembled him with the kanji for demon on his clothing, giving him a warm yet somehow wolfish smile as he praised him. King Piccolo then looked his son over, feeling his immense power, and said, Well done, Junior. Piccolo Jr. mirrored his father's evil grin, and before Piccolo Sr. could understand what was happening, he felt his son grab him around the neck, being lifted into the air. Piccolo thanks his father for his praise and this opportunity, but explains that right now he needs his influence, and the next instant, King Piccolo was gone. Piccolo then began to laugh evilly, feeling the urges to be less violent fade away somewhat, being replaced with a thirst for conquest. Testing out his new powers, Piccolo pointed to the big empty space that the battle had taken place in, and was actually able to recreate the Namekian ship he had arrived in, though this one was a bit bigger and it seemed a lot sturdier. He walked into it, setting his sights back on conquest. This time, he would win, and he knew just the way to ensure his victory. That said, there was the problem of Goku's kid. With the power he had shown, he could be a problem, but he was a warrior and wanted to win his control over the universe as such, so he had better get training. He then splits himself into two halves and decides he'll begin roughly training of the replica ship. He'd give himself and the forces of Earth three years, just like he did when Goku and him first fought. And this time, the demon would win. Gohan is taken back to Guru's with young Namekian they learn was actually named Cargo and is healed by a Namekian healer, as Guru explains that he will not be alive much longer. He still names Odomori his successor and tells the Earthlings that he is sorry for this situation, but thanks them for bringing peace to the planet. He explains the time that they'll need to wait, and it's decided that they would stay on Namek to wish Chaozu, Tien, and Turtles back to life. And the next Namekian year, they would wish Raditz back to life. At his request, they try to wish Kami's immortality away, but Harunga says it's outside of his power, as an influence stronger than him is affecting it. They decide they would leave the last wish for the Namekians to use at their own disclosure, and wish to be transported to Earth. And all return to Earth where Raditz, actually having returned already, has two very big surprises for them. A wife he apparently met in Otherworld, and a son. Three if you count the kid in the purple jacket. Hey, what's up, Poster fam? You guys know who it is. Now, this is going to be a different type of video than what we usually have on the channel. It's more narrative and character driven. This is about getting you guys to understand why and how Princess Nick and Raditz got together. Now, to help her better fit into the canon, I've actually changed Princess Nick's race in this timeline. She's going to be a part of Zarbon's race. I've always found it interesting that both her and Zarbon are blue characters who have a reptilian transformation, and thought that there might be a connection there. So with that said, I present to you the story of Raditz and Snake. Raditz's body had disappeared very soon after he had given Vegeta his last sensu bean and watched the other Saiyan fly back in to attack the Frost Demons. He was angry and wanted to watch the end of the tormentors of his race, but he had faith in his little brother and the Prince of All Saiyans. Kakarot had told him that the Dragon Balls had the power to revive the dead, so that meant that this would not be a permanent end to him, right? Against his better judgment, the older Saiyan began to have doubts, and for a while was looking very awkward in the long line of souls, as he saw King Yama sitting at the center of his desk. He then began to try to put on his usual bravado, saying that hell probably wouldn't be too bad, and that he'd maybe see his father, maybe even get a good fight with him. Though we doubted he'd see his mother there, as she would always have been much too sweet. He began to cheer more and more at the idea of seeing his father again, but was brought up his musings when King Yama began yelling at him for holding up the line. The long-haired Saiyan walked forward, and was prepared to be sent to hell, but Yama actually pointed towards Snake Way, saying that King Kai had asked to see him, and Raditz almost dropped his job before laughing and running right down the long road at high speed. As fast as he was, he knew the trip couldn't take him too long, but in the middle of his flight, he ended up passing a large palace, and could smell food from it. He stopped and decided that a meal wouldn't hurt, as he was dead and had a lot of time on his hands now. He stopped and entered into the large palace and noticed a few things. This was some kind of inn slash restaurant. The staff seemed to all be women with an almost blue complexion that reminded him of someone that he couldn't place his finger on. 
And finally, there was an ogre currently yelling about his meal and asked for more food because apparently he would need it all and had a long journey to King Kai's to train. Radis then laughed at the proud boast of the large ogre, which got his attention. He snarked that he was going to need a lot more than food to make the King Kai's, and besides, it was impossible to die of hunger up here, so he might as well just let the ladies do their jobs and serve others. He snarked all of this in his usual bravado like way. The ogre then got in his face and roared that he was the one who surpassed King Yemen, and as such, the food belonged to him. The ogre also made the mistake of pushing Radis. Needless to say, the next second, the ogre was sent flying out of the restaurant, and Radis was in his seat ordering a meal. He was served pretty quickly by one of the waitresses who thanked him for the help and soon had a curly haired woman walk over. He noticed she had an air like Vegeta's, that of royalty. She thanked him for dealing with the brew and said that she didn't want to do it herself as it was pretty unladylike before she giggled and sat next to him. She said that usually they charge a portion of someone's soul for a meal but his would be on the house today. Radis then gave her a grin somewhat across between Trellis's snarky smirk and Goku's genuine smile and asked her name to which he was given Snake. The two began to conversate like old friends, making the time fly by. She informed him that this place was a rest stop between Snake Way and King Kai's, and most warriors gave up before reaching this place. She also mentions that she was the owner and actually asked King Yima to allow her to run this place in return for her and her servants having their bodies to use in Otherworld. Radis really enjoyed himself here and the company and decides that he would return here after going to King Kai's, as the trip was very quick for him and King Kai probably wouldn't mind him coming and going so far as he was there and back within a reasonable amount of time to train. By the time that Bowman and her team reached Namek, Snake and he had grown very, very close. One eventful visit involved one of the servers accidentally referring to Snake as Princess, which she'd actually avoided up till now. This caused the woman to turn pale as Radis' suspicions about her royalty status were confirmed, and he began to interrogate her about this aspect of herself that she had kept out of their conversations. She gains a very solemn look, Having already been told that Radis was ex Frieza Force, asked the question, Do you know of a man named Zarbon? Now this got Radis' eyes to widen, as he had confirmed that yes, he did know of a man named Zarbon, and had assumed that they were of the same race, since they both had the same bluish skin and almost reptilian eyes. But then he gains a proud smile and claims that he was actually the one who killed Zarbon. Snake then looks especially surprised, and surges forward, hugging the man, almost crying. Once calmed down, Snake reveals that not only was Zarbon the prince of their world, but also her older brother. She explains that their world was sold to them by the Frieza forces, and that Zarbon had grown angry with their father because he felt that the monarchy should be disbanded. Zarbon did not like this idea, and as such decided that if he could not rule their world, then there would be no world. He contacted Frieza behind their backs and lied about a plan to overthrow the Emperor, which Frieza took at face value. Zarbon told this to her and her father as he fled the planet, gaining some sadistic pleasure from it, as he had served Frieza since then. Raditz was sent reeling from this information, but it didn't really change how he felt about Snake at this point. He knew that he had fallen in love with this woman already. She wasn't as outspoken as Kakarot's mate, but by no means was she weak. And besides, when she wanted to, she could be incredibly terrifying, especially when mad. She would fly into her monster form whenever a patron was rude to one of her servers. Now we can skip to the time after Tullus had died in battle on Namek. He and like his best friend wasted no time in making it down Snake Way, as he was very excited to see Raditz but was surprised to arrive to King Kai's and find Tien and Raditz training. Now let's say that Raditz and Snake had decided to get together about three months before this event takes place, so he also finds a pregnant Snake there as well. Trellis makes the usual congratulations and slightly asks if this means that Raditz and Launch would not be a couple. This actually gets Snake to go into her monster form here of a romantic rival. A while later, King Kai ends up contacting the Namekians after the Earthlings had wished to be transported to Earth and asks them to use the last wish to revive Snake as she couldn't just stay there on King Kai's planet with the baby for too much longer. Radis' group makes it down Snake Way very fast, having trained at King Kai's pretty hard and gotten a lot stronger. They meet the Z Fighters, excluding Vegeta and Goku, who are apparently on their way back to Earth in space pods. Radis and Snake then proudly introduce their son to the world, Zuko, a mixture of a traditional Saiyan name and the traditional of Zarbon's race to have kings named with a Z. The purple-haired kid had given his message to Raditz, explaining that he wanted to tell Goku, but he knew he could trust Raditz as well. After introducing himself as Trunks, he explains that he's from the future, and in his timeline, Goku and Vegeta die of a mysterious heart virus that he was carrying the cure for, and bestows it onto Raditz. He elaborates that the two would be critical in stopping the upcoming threat, and warns that in three years, two androids would appear that were stronger than anyone, and in his timeline, because the Earth's fighters weren't prepared or protecting children, they fell to the menace. In his timeline, the only ones that had been able to survive this long were his mother, him, and his teacher Turles, who had been injured beyond the capability of fighting. He'd even lost his other teacher Gohan to them. With his job done, Trunks takes his leave, promising to return in three years. 
The Z-Warriors had three years to prepare for this menace, and this actually worries Rats a lot, as they were still the threat of Piccolo. But according to Turles, Vegeta and Goku had probably grown strong enough at this point to be able to stop him very easily, so he wouldn't be a huge problem. Right as Trunks was lifting off in his time machine, Vegeta and Goku instantly transmissioned themselves to Kame House, sensing almost everyone there, and for the first time, Trunks lays eyes on his father. He bursts his emotions and leads the groups to their preparations. Z Fighters are grouped together, and Raditz is able to give everyone the warning and the game plan for the next three years. Everyone must start training harder than ever. Now, because the two had just spent a lot of time training together on Yardrat, I want to say that Vegeta and Goku really know each other now. They have a relationship similar to what they do now in the canon story, where if one were to really boil it down, they could actually be called friends. Also, quick side note, there is no baseline power of Mecha Frieza or Super Saiyan Trunks for the Z Fighters to train against. Only Trunks, which I will say is a weaker Trunks than in canon. Raditz links up with Goku and Gohan, while Turles sets aside his dislike for Vegeta, since he isn't as high and mighty as he used to be, and he's a lot more tolerable now. Now, don't get me wrong, I think it's extremely possible to argue that since Goku and Vegeta are already much stronger than their canon counterparts before the three years of training, the androids should stand no real chance, since there was no real Saiyan saga on Earth for Jiro to monitor and see how much stronger Goku had gotten. But what I want to do here is play with Jiro as a character a bit, some of the power scaling, some of the timing of events, and a few character interactions. I also want to note that Vegeta and Goku didn't get extremely stronger on Yardrat due to having no goal and having to learn to control Super Saiyan as well as the transmission technique. Now think back to part one of this timeline. We had some really big changes. Rats and Turles came to recruit Goku and Piccolo became the ruler of Earth for a long while. So here, Jiro doesn't base his androids just off defeating Goku, but off the idea of defeating any kind of alien beings like Goku and the Saiyans and even dreading the idea that Saiyans might return stronger and in larger numbers. This causes Jiro to really double his efforts. Literally, he ends up making a second android body which follows his orders like Android 19 would. This is able to cut his work in half. With so much time left over and paranoia in full swing, Jiro makes a decision. He will revisit his projects for Androids 17 and 18 and decides that if he were to limit the power of Android 18 by a much larger degree than he originally tried to, it may be a lot more possible to control her. Maybe through a more invasive type procedure, he could take away her free will. So, he decides to further limit her power to 50% of her overall max, and this is able to, in a way, lobotomize her. This leaves her a shallow husk of who she really is, but she ends up listening to the orders of Dr. Jiro. Unfortunately for Jiro, all this eats up the time frame he had wanted to work off of, and with the Saiyans having returned and in greater number by his observation, he decides against doing the same thing to number 17 as well, and instead leaves he and number 16 in his lab. Meanwhile, for the Z Fighters, training is going well as Goku and Vegeta have gotten Turles and Raditz very close to reaching the form of Super Saiyan, while Gohan is able to turn it on by will half the time, usually needing to be very angry beforehand. But at the year and a half mark, Goku and Vegeta mysteriously collapse, and Raditz realizes that they must have never taken their heart medicine, but after a week or two of being bedridden and getting no better, they are actually moved to hospitals where they remain in constant pain for the next six months. Finally, they both begin to slowly recover. And Goku admits that on Yardrat, he and Vegeta would spar and fight a lot. Boma hearing this hypothesized that Goku and Vegeta could have actually gotten their heart viruses on Yardrat and possibly accelerate their condition, to which Vegeta admits he'd been having heart pains for the last year or so, but simply refused to stop training for them. After being told off, this results in the two having to, in a way, go through a bit of rehab, as Raditz suggests that the group should save all the sensu beings they could until their next threat came. Goku and Vegeta returned to 100% two months later after this event, and so only received 28 months of training out of the overall three years. Thankfully, Turles and Raditz are able to finish their training and achieve Super Saiyan, where Gohan, having grown a lot fonder of Krillin and Yamcha in their time on Nemec, decides to spend the rest of his training with them, so they could avoid death in the coming battle as well. The Z Fighters meet in the same spot as in canon at the same time overlooking South City. Bulma and Baby Trunks are there as well, and Vegeta is already there with the group. Yajirobe delivers a big bag of sensu beans, and as he flies away, at the same time his car explodes, so too does the entirety of South City, leaving a huge crater where the town once was, and four figures rise out of it into the air. Dr. Jiro berates number 18, telling her he didn't want her to do any damage in the city because he knew this would happen, that his order was only applied to androids number 19 and 20, and if she had a free will, 18 would have snapped that he should have specified that. Note, in this timeline, Jiro is actually Android 21 since he made a copy of himself which would be Android 20. Goku and the Z Fighters quickly rush over to the androids, finding the group unmistakably for any ordinary human, except for having no sensible energy whatsoever. Pleasantries are exchanged, and Goku angrily realizes that there is no need to take the battle elsewhere, as South City is completely gone, and both groups land and begin to size each other up. 
Four androids and four pure-blooded Saiyans, raring for a good fight. Goku and his Saiyan comrades tell the others to stand back and let them handle this. But then something of a squabble pops up between the group. Alright, I'll take the fat one. Raditz, you take one of the old men. Turles, you the other. Vegeta, you take on the lady. Hey! I'm not fighting a woman! You take her on, Kakarot! No way! Turles, you take her on! Wait, why do I have to? I thought I'd take on the old man! This is a no-win situation for all of us! Either we beat up a fat ass, a geezer, or some woman! And Vegeta's kids said this would be a threat! What a joke! Wait! So you mean to tell me that purple-haired hoodlum was my son? Why didn't you tell me? Well, he said not to. Shut up! Everyone, take down Goku! Before the Saiyan warriors could squabble any further, the blonde cyborg rammed into Goku, who just barely had time to put up a guard and begin to take her on, realizing she was stronger than him, yes, but not by any amount that made the fight too dangerous for him. Turles was attacked by Android 20, which tried to drain his power almost instantly, and being unaware of this technique, Turles unfortunately gets caught up in the attacks of the Android. A similar situation happens to Raditz and Vegeta, but after Raditz sees it happen to two other people, he is smart enough to avoid the hands of Android 19 and kicks the fat android away, deciding to try and help Turles out ASAP while telling Vegeta to avoid Jiro's hands. That said, the Saiyan Prince is no coward and allows Jiro to grab both of his hands before doing exactly what he did to 19 in canon and tears Jiro's hands off completely. The mad scientist, however, is not off put by this as he had planned for this. This is exactly why he tried to overpower his alien opponents with numbers instead of power alone. He orders everyone to converge on Goku, and soon, all four androids are on top of the orange-clad Saiyan warrior. Jiro, though handless, shoots an eye beam that pierces Goku's side and slows him down, as 19 and this timeline's Android 20 both grab him and begin to drain him heavily, as 18 absolutely beats down on him. The situation looks extremely dire as Vegeta and the other Saiyans rush to help their comrade, but they're passed by the form of Gohan, as he flies forward and actually flies through the form of Dr. Jiro, and with a single punch, takes off Android 19's head. That's right, because of his potential as a hybrid Saiyan and his full three years of training, Gohan is actually the strongest Z fighter at the moment. Vegeta and the others are then able to get Goku out of harm's way, but 18 is able to grab Vegeta by the leg and swing him around harshly. He begins to thrash him back and forth continuously, and Gohan and the rest of Z fighters step in to help. But 18's new Vegeta back was an effective weapon, and everyone was beaten down. Goku swallows his pride and tells Vegeta they have to get out of there, and the prince, while being swung around, realizing his leg was not only broken, but completely out of the socket and useless, has no choice but to agree. He uses in transmission and is able to escape 18's grip, and is nice enough to get a few of the Z fighters to grab onto him, before he uses in transmission again to escape to a safe place, namely being Capsicorp, since it was where he lived. Goku takes the rest of the Z fighters to the lookout, where Krillin gives everybody sensu beams, and after a bit, Vegeta arrives there as well, hoping to get a sensu beam from Krillin. Back with Dr. Rowe and his androids, he decides they need to further pursue the Z fighters, but first, tears his brain out of his current body and has Android 20 put it in his, resulting in Jiro now being stronger from Goku's energy and having a brand new body. With that done, Jiro and 18 fly away to pursue their prey, but they miss two things. Number one, Bulma and Baby Trunks are still on the cliff overlooking the battle, and number two, Future Trunks arrives on the cliff from his time machine, sees the huge crater with bits and pieces of Android here and there, and then asks his mother what the hell had happened here. Bulma fills him in, but when she is done, she mentions that she didn't know Dr. Robo was one of the androids, and this makes Trunks gawk. He looks at her and asks what she meant, and she explains who Jiro is, and mentions she thinks she knows where his lab is. Trunks instantly barks at her to show him, and he grabs her, blasting off towards where she directed him. Back with Jiro, he makes the decision to decrease 18's power dampening to only 7% of her total, because based off his surveillance, Goku would always get stronger after taking extreme damage. On the lookout, Goku begins to rack his brain for a plan before Kami suggests that he make use of the Roman Spirit in time again, as he removed the two-day limit on it. Yes, a full day might be too long, but at this point, the group was in dire straits and they needed what they could get. Goku agrees to this, and he grabs a few sensu beans from the massive bag, throws the rest of them to Braddis, and tells him that he was in charge, before taking his favorite training partner, Vegeta, into the Roman Spirit in time to try and grow stronger than 18. Note that Goku does not take Gohan because as the strongest, someone needs to be there to fight 18 if she begins to cause more trouble. Raditz and the others are left with few other options, but before anything else, the long-haired Saiyan decides he wants to go out and check on Snake, Zuko, and Chi-Chi to make sure that they were okay. He then flies out to Mount Pauzu where he had built his own home, Charles and Gohan close behind him. They arrive and see that everything is fine, but Blonde Launch was also there, claiming to be protecting the women and young Zuko, who at age 3 was already walking and talking. Interestingly enough, Launch and Turles don't get along very well, and as usually, they begin one of their famous arguments, with Launch calling the man a knockoff Goku. 
This connects two wires in the brilliant tactical mind of Raditz and gives him an idea. Trellis and Goku could be twins, and Goku was Jiro's main target, to his knowledge at least. He asked Chi-Chi to bring him one of Goku's geese and let Trellis put it on, for telling Trellis to follow him and for Gohan to stay here to keep everyone safe. In the middle of the sky, Raditz and Trellis in his new outfit begin to charge their power to attract the androids, and lo and behold, they show up and are seen to be approaching. Curious, Trellis asks Raditz what his plan was, but looks back to see that he was already flying in the other direction and begins to follow him, asking Raditz if he really planned to run around for the next 23 hours. Without missing a beat, Raditz says yes and tells him that if they get tired to eat a sensu bean, they have to buy as much time as possible and limit the damage of the androids. We can then return back to Bulma, Trunks, and Baby Trunks, who are able to break into Dr. Rose's lab, where Trunks tries to destroy the remaining pods, but Bulma steps in to stop him, explaining that if she could study these two, she could possibly find a way to destroy the androids remotely or maybe get them on their side, which is reasonable enough for Trunks to go along with it and allows her to do her work. Even if you argue that Trunks' hatred for the androids is too potent to be convinced to not destroy them, Bulma is still very persuasive, and I think she can appeal to the side of Trunks that is her son. It explains to him that even though he was half Saiyan, he was also half genius. Every problem didn't have to be solved by brute force, and if that didn't work, she could always just pull the mom card and yell at him. So allowing his mother to do her work, and while holding his younger self, he comes across the plans to make 18 more docile, and shows his mother who while trying to multitask, messes up and accidentally activates Android 17. The cyborg is completely confused as to who the two were, but then begins to look around for his sister, and once not seeing her, gets aggressive. In an effort to protect his mother and his younger self, Trunks tries to attack the cyborg, but is easily put down. But before 17 and Trunks can take this any further, Bulma shoves the plans to make 18 docile in 17's face, and explains exactly what Jiro had done to her. This angers 17, and Bulma reasons with him saying that she could remove that annoying little bug to destroy his son Goku and help him find Jiro and save his sister, but he has to get back in his pod and allow her to finish her work. The cocky cyborg growls but sighs and climbs back in, complying. 23 hours later, Raditz and Turles, tired and out of sensu beans, are heading towards the lookout at the same time that Bulma and her three bodyguards are. They all land simultaneously, and 17 and 16, seeing Jiro approaching, instantly pounce on him, destroying him. With their creator gone, Seventeen begins to try and reason with his sister, who without the orders of Dr. Jiro, decides to wait for Son Goku to arrive. However, it doesn't take long before Goku and Vegeta exit the time chamber, now much more powerful than any of the androids of this timeline had been. Eighteen, seeing her prey, tries to rush Goku, but is knocked out by a quick shot from Android 16. Bulma then steps up to explain the entire situation, but before anything else could happen, a dark chuckle rings out around the lookout, and everyone looks up to see the culprit. It was Piccolo standing on one of the towers of the lookout and laughing as he sported what looked to be extremely heavy training gear. Hey, what's up Plus Ultra fam? It's me, Plus Ultra Man, and today we're going to take a look at the escapades of Piccolo during his three years of training in space. Remember, this takes place at the same time as Goku and the Z Fighters training, as well as Dr. Jiro's plans. Piccolo had started his training but was already incredibly happy with his growth. He had found a myriad of new powers and abilities due to absorbing gas and his father, and the initial strength gain from both assimilations were massive. But he wasn't going to let that get to his head. The power Gohan had shown on Namek was extremely potent, and considering how much stronger it made him, when he couldn't even control it, it meant he couldn't slow down on his own training by any means. Not to mention, after absorbing gas, he gained knowledge of what Gohan had achieved, and this spurred him on even more, since it was a possibility that Goku and the other Saiyans could do something similar. He began to try and replicate the effects of training in the room of spirit and time, traveling to planets that had intensely high gravity and even some which had extreme weather conditions. He created very heavy training weights and decided to leave them on for as long as possible and would constantly stick multiform clones on himself in brutal training battles. Because all of his fusing had really increased his vitality, he spent little time not physically training. In the other time, he would meditate, but this wasn't a preferred use of his time as his mind had been unable to completely absorb the consciousness of gas in King Piccolo a side effect of forceful Namekian assimilation. Every time he would stop to meditate, gas and sometimes the individual Namekians that made him up as well as his father would all get into very heated and annoying arguments. Evil Namekians aren't even supposed to exist! Turn your heart and body over to me and allow me to control this great power in the name of good! Silence, you goody two-shoes buffoon! My son is doing exactly what I created him for. I'm happy to give my life to the Neo-Demon King to conquer the universe and take what is ours. Both of you, shut up! Suffice to say, it'd be comical if it wasn't so distracting. This made his training mostly physical over the last year and a half. Gas and the good Namekians were the real issue here. His father's presence wasn't so bad, as the two were mostly in harmony. Mostly. 
If he could somehow absorb more even Mechians, then he could possibly overwhelm the goodness of conscience. It would also result in even more power. It wasn't like he hadn't considered returning to Namek and absorbing every single Namekian there. The issue was, good would eventually overwhelm his heart, and the odds of running into another Namekian with evil in his heart were slim to none. For now, he continued training, and maybe find a populated planet to conquer along the way. A while later, his ship's motion was stopped by something. This made no sense, as he wasn't moving slow at all. He then felt the ship land, apparently tractor beams were real. Stepping out of the ship, he found himself surrounded by soldiers, pointing blasters, as well as four other warriors that seemed much different from the others. Standing above all of them was a massive figure. What is this? Don't waste my time with foolish games. One of the four warriors began a retort, but Piccolo's eye beams turned him into dust before he got the first syllable. The rest of the soldiers and warriors surrounding him took this as their cue to attack before their leader even directed them to do so. They began to fire a volley of key blasts at Piccolo, but none of them were able to hit the mark. Using his key like a gum, he stops the army of key blasts only feet away from his body, keeping them suspended in midair. Then with precise and deadly accuracy, he roars and uses it like a rubber, causing the energy bolts to shoot out and return to their cinders with more power than ever, destroying or injuring every warrior in the room, except the biggest one viewed as a leader who, like Piccolo, could wave off the key blast with little strain. The figure chuckled darkly and removed his mask, as well as ripping off the sleeves of his jacket, revealing himself- Interesting! Another Super Namekian with evil in his heart! We're a rare breed, you and I. Why not fuse with me, kid? I can sense the last few drugs of good in you. I'll help you snuff that out, and in return, you can be a part of me as I conquer the galaxy! <laughs> Thanks for the offer, old man, but I'm afraid this universe and all its spoils are mine by birthright. I'll take your power and influence for myself, though. And with that, the two evil Namekians clashed inside the ship. Piccolo was younger, and because of all his battles with different warriors, experience, as well as fusion, he now had a massive and versatile arsenal of attacks and techniques he could use to throw his opponents off his game. The older Namekian, however, was purely powerful and boasted a large repertoire of techniques himself. Lots of them perfect counter to whatever Piccolo would pull out at him. The battle raged on for an extremely long time. Neither Namekian had need of eating or resting to an extreme extent, and both being very aware of the other forcing Namekian assimilation, whenever one of them grew tired, the other would back off. Finally, the older Namekian began to tire. His age betrayed his great power, and Piccolo, as ruthless as ever, shot forward in a green blur to absorb him, but was stopped short when an energy barrier blew him back. Piccolo cursed at his luck, he was also tiring out, and couldn't think of a way to end this without killing his opponent. That wasn't an option, he needed this power desperately, as well as further evil influence. Visions of the Saiyans growing stronger and becoming Super Saiyans flashed in his mind. This seemed to be another failure. His was a legacy of failure. From his father being sealed with the Mafuba, all the way to losing to Goku in the tournament. If this was his end, then he'd have to risk it all. I have my father's memories of the technique, as well as my own encounter with it when Kami tried it. The ship will be my container. It's so big it leaves some room for error. Besides, I don't need to complete it. Just throw him off his guard for a second. With his last ditch strategy finished, the younger Namekian rushed his opponent, a fierce battle cry relieving him. The other Namekian again activated his barrier, still not ready for another round of close combat. Just before Piccolo is about to make contact with it though, he stops on a dime and spins while yelling, Evil Containment Wave! The technique was clumsy and unpolished, but it pulled the older Namekian off his feet and into the air in a green spiral shooting him towards Piccolo's ship. The technique petered out just before he entered though, and when he turned to reface Piccolo, he was horrified when the younger Namekian was already on top of him, capturing him by wrapping him in his arms and activating the force fusion. A flash of light later and a large Piccolo is left, standing at the entrance of his ship, panting, he collapses inside and has the ship take off, escaping the much larger ship he'd been pulled into. So, your name is Slug. Welcome to the family. The Neo Demon King passed out soon after. The rest of this time in space was spent training and honing his great power. He was even able to enjoy meditation once more, though adding one more voice only resulted in the sight of evil when he got more of the time than the sight of good did. He would not fail this time. Though he was extremely tired, Raditz picked himself off the ground, just enough to peer between the androids, Goku and Vegeta's quiet yet serious confusion, and Piccolo's constant chuckling. Because they had last seen Android 18 as their biggest threat, Goku and Vegeta, Vegeta especially, 
move to take her on. But Bone reveals herself from behind Android 16 and explains the situation to them. After a good amount of back and forth with all the Z fighters, the blue haired woman was able to convince everyone that the androids were on their side now. In the confusion, 18 moves to attack Goku, but her brother knocks her out just where she could. Carrying her, he tells Trunks to grab his mother and follow him to Jiro's lab before blasting off towards it. Trunks and 16 follow close behind him afterwards. Goku, sweat dropping from that situation being wrapped up so anticlimactically, looks to Piccolo and asks what he was doing back on Earth. His betrayal on Namek had sealed his fate as an enemy in the eyes of the Z Fighters. He didn't just kill Turles, but he also hurt Gohan, and that was unforgivable. Piccolo again chuckled and asked how Gohan was currently doing. This is interrupted when Turles, finally catching his breath, rushes at him with rage in the Super Saiyan state, which to his credit did make Piccolo take him seriously for a bit. Sadly for Turles, Piccolo put him on the ground with a massive punch, rendering the Goku lookalike completely unconscious. Side note, I know it seems like Turles gets crapped on a lot in this series, but wait. No, there's no bright side, I'm just saying that I noticed it. Back to the story, Goku and Vegeta were put off by this because in that small showing of power, Piccolo's strength came frighteningly close to their own. Goku then told Piccolo, out of curiosity, to take off those massive weights, and he does so. But in classic Rock Lee fashion, these weights actually make huge craters in the lookout. It was a miracle they didn't fall all the way through. Those weights were 500 tons in total. I've taken them off two times in the last three years. He then powered up fully, Goku and Vegeta did begin to power up themselves and are able to push themselves into their Super Saiyan states easily before going beyond even that into the second grade of Super Saiyan. Damn it! I was afraid he'd still be stronger. We could use that other form we found, but it slows us down too much. Vegeta, I told you we should have. Shut up! I know! Piccolo then began to chuckle and stretch even more, enjoying not being weighed down and the shifting power dynamics. Goku, I've wanted a rematch for a long time. But now I'm more interested in defeating that boy of yours. He's younger than you were when you killed my father, and yet he's unequivocally stronger than you and will likely continue to be so. Hell, he even discovered that Super Saiyan thing at a younger age than you. Yeah, my boy is something else. I'm proud of him. If you want to fight him, I'll prepare him to defeat you like Kami did for me. Hmm. <laughs> I'm guessing you plan to use the Room of Spirit and Time again. Of course. Not gonna happen. You and Vegeta have already had three turns in that place, so you aren't allowed in there again and I'll keep you out myself. You know I can. Here's my deal. You have five Saiyans. I can make four other allies fight with me. We'll have an old-fashioned tournament, and the finale will be me and your boy. I'll allow a fool on the ground there, as well as your brother and son to train in the room one final time. I will also be allowed to enter the room myself one last time. Then considers everything and looks at Vegeta, who gives him a look. As I've stated earlier in the series, these two know each other very well at this point. And to Goku, that look said, if it were my choice, you know I'd allow this. Goku's Saiyan blood was boiling at this point, and before he knew it, he said, Deal! And by the way, we have six Saiyans! My brats will also be fighting, so you'll need five allies, Namekian! Fine. That means two at a time, with me by myself for three days. So I'll give you all five days. Raditz storms over to his brother, fuming, and wants to hit him, but he knows that their best tactical move right now was to power up even further, and if Gohan was as strong as they'd always thought him to be, then he was their best hope. Piccolo then flies back up to his original perch and begins to meditate, while also standing guard to not allow Goku and Vegeta to enter the room of spirit and time again. Raditz goes over and picks up Turles, shaking his head at the other Saiyan's antics and trying to take him to Korin's tower in front of the Sensu Bee. Goku decides to go tell Gohan what was going on and puts his fingers to his head before disappearing. Kami then approaches Vegeta and asks him to go and investigate the incident in a place called Ginger Town. And the Saiyan, needing to blow off some steam, takes the offer. I'm actually going to have First Form Cell killed here by Vegeta, as Vegeta is number one, way too strong, and number two, unwilling to let Cell power up since Piccolo is already here in this situation. I know a lot of people comment on part seven that they wanted to see Cell absorbed by Piccolo, but that's not where this timeline is going and Cell just doesn't have any place in it. Again, I'll explain what I did here in this timeline at the end of the video. On Mount Paozu, Goku and Gohan's conversation about what was going to happen next goes down pretty smooth, at least to an extent. Gohan has moved into the role of a warrior with a bit more ease in this timeline, but Goku knows full well that Gohan does not like to fight. That established that little fact before the battle with Vegeta back in part two of this series, but he was also sure that Gohan was willing to push beyond that for the sake of his family and the work. 
What he isn't aware of though, is the pressure this plan puts on his son. Next, Goku goes to see Raditz to strategize with him and Turl to see if he recovered. Though the other Saiyan now had a huge mark on his pride, Goku explains that he and Vegeta while in the time chamber had pushed past the Super Saiyan limit as they had seen on the lookout. He even goes so far as to show them Super Saiyan Grade 3, though they both instantly realize how slow the form would be and dismiss it as useless. Goku explains that he knows that and that was Vegeta's idea to simply power up, but he himself has this new idea and I did what he was going to call the Master Super Saiyan State, wanting Raditz and the other Saiyans to try and see if it was possible. Now, this moment is very critical because here, Raditz like Gohan has a lot of pressure put on him. Remember, he is now like his younger brother, so the idea of betting everyone's lives on this idea is very concerning. Raditz not only has his own life to fear, but now the life of his wife and child, and that's a big weight for him to bear. So the next day, Turles and Trunks decide to enter the time chamber with the goal of surpassing Piccolo and mastering their Super Saiyan power. Now their time in the time chamber will be very interesting. Turles along with future Gohan had trained Trunks in the future, so he is already attached to the older Saiyan, while Turles has no emotional connection to Trunks whatsoever. This kind of makes Turles reflect on something he's noticed as of now. He was apparently pretty good with kids. Gohan and he got along famously, and the way Trunks looked at him with so much respect, apparently his future counterpart made a good impression on this kid as well. Even Raditz's son Zuko loved his uncle Turles. Maybe he'd settle down and have his own kid sometime, but for now, he felt a desire to take Trunks under his wing, help him become more Saiyan-like. This could help reduce the strain on he and Vegeta's relationship as well. Their training goes very well since Trunks, having already learned from Turles in the future, is very quick to learn from his teaching style. After 24 hours, they are able to complete both their goals and even plan to take on Piccolo now since it would be easier to do so and would save everyone a lot of trouble. But Goku and Vegeta stopped them as soon as they exited the time chamber, already expecting this and explaining that they gave their word. Turles and Trunks cursed this but accepted it. Like I said, Trunks had learned some more about Saiyan culture so he understands a bit more about his father's pride in this timeline than he does in canon and he's able to accept it a lot better. After seeing the results of the Master Super Saiyan state, Raditz can see that Goku's plan does work which relaxes him somewhat but he soon realizes that Piccolo would also be trained, so he couldn't relax just yet. Gohan was just happy his father's plan could work, but he'd be lying if he said he didn't want Trunks to go through with his attack on Piccolo. Once in the room is spared in time, Gohan realizes he's in for a very tough year, as the stressed out Raditz made the training very brutal. Much like Raditz's original plan to train Goku and Gohan in part 2, he would make Gohan train constantly, only allowing him to sleep when he was absolutely exhausted and could barely even move. Any time not physically fighting would be used for image training or strategizing. Because of this, the training is tense and it puts the two warriors at each other's necks in terms of a very tense situation. See, at some point, Raditz stops seeing Gohan as his nephew that he loves and more as a weapon that he has to use to protect his family. Gohan can sort of see where Raditz is coming from and why he's so high strong, but it's grating on him a lot. Something this Gohan would actually struggle with a lot is his identity as a Saiyan and a human. He looks up to both his father, the Earthborn Saiyan, and his uncle, the Vegeta-born Saiyans. So he's often in conflict with himself about which course is better for him. And right now, the Saiyan course is not shown the best light, especially because of how Raditz is pushing him to try and be more of a traditional Saiyan. This was so he could try and pull out some of the natural ferocity that all Saiyans have. However brutal and intense it was, their training does render some pretty good results, and later on, the two exit, being extremely powerful in their own right, much stronger than what Goku had hoped for them to get. Seeing this, Piccolo is only excited and instantly enters the room to begin his own hardcore training. Outside, Raditz decides he wants to go spend the next few days with his family, but tells Gohan that he will meet up with him later on for sparring and some strategizing before he flies away. Gohan stays with his dad to see how strong Piccolo would get once he exits the time chamber, and the two speak about the harsh training that Gohan just went through, with Goku trying to get Gohan to relax a little bit, but it does not work at all. Finally, Piccolo emerges a day later, and the gap between Gohan and Piccolo's power had indeed widened, but it was in Gohan's favor. That said, he still had those heavy weights on, so it couldn't be his full strength, and this was confirmed by how confident Piccolo was still, even though he could sense Gohan's power. He only smirks at Goku, and tells him to keep his word before flying away from the lookout. The next two days aren't full of relaxation though. Goku encourages Gohan and Raditz to do so, but they just keep training, busy and stressing themselves out even more to 
the point where Goku steps in to put a stop to it, and it's decided that they would just rest for the last day to make sure that no one was too tired before they had to go to the fight. On the day of Piccolo's tournament, the Z Fighters meet in the Wasteland, where Piccolo had apparently made his own tournament arena that resembled the World Martial Arts Tournament Stadium. Staying with him were five other figures. One was a Namekian that seemed pretty familiar to Gohan, yet completely stranger at the same time. Two creatures that didn't even look like normal Namekians at all. A very big burly Namekian no one recognized, and one tall Namekian with a savage sneer that Goku remembered all too well. Piccolo gives a quick explanation that after absorbing his father, he gained the ability to create children like he did, though most of these Namekians were based off his past conquests, such as Nail and the one called Slug. And just because the Six Saiyans were the combatants for the side of good, that doesn't mean that they were the only ones in attendance. The androids, all missing their bombs and with 18 back to normal, as well as the human fighters had shown up, but they're all told to stay out of the fight or Piccolo would show them no mercy. Piccolo explains that a ring out was considered a loss, though flight was allowed, though if one were to hit the ground or leave the confines of the arena, it was a loss. The ring was incredibly strong, so it would be hard to damage. Wins could be attained by knockout or death, and he sends in his first competitor, Tambourine, who is now about as strong as second form Cell in canon. Even though he is much stronger than Tambourine, Curlis was the one to step into the ring. He, more than anyone, wanted to tear through Piccolo's minions and get a shot at the big boss himself. Piccolo mentions that he forgot to explain that every fighter is allowed one match. The only person he's interested in is Gohan, so this was all pretty much just a game to really enjoy his victory. Turles, once again being made a fool of, curses as he's wasted his power on the weakest of the enemy. And considering he, along with Trunks, Raditz, and Gohan, were the strongest of the group, that wasn't a good thing. He yells bloody murder, and as soon as Tambourine enters the ring, he is cooked alive by Turles' kill drive, and the Goku lookalike turns on his heels and exits the ring, plopping down on the ground almost angry enough to blow up the plant. After seeing his comrade reduced to dust, the Namekian drum steps forward, but he's pulled back by King Piccolo, who is the first of these offspring to speak and show some cognition. He calls Goku out by name, and Goku can sense that he is about half as strong as the actual Piccolo. The only one stronger was the big Namekian slug. Never a coward, he enters the ring against Raditz's wishes, but Goku explains that he has a plan. As soon as the match starts, King Piccolo, not underestimating this kid again, rushes Goku. He expects to outpower him, but just as he gets close, Goku closes the distance and bulks up to the great through Super Saiyan form, allowing him to land a devastating blow on the opponent right in the midsection. Goku's strategy was to play defense as a regular Super Saiyan, and when seeing an opening, attack as the Ultra Super Saiyan. And finally, with his might, he is able to drive a fist through Demon King Piccolo's torso and tries to throw him from the ring. But the hole closes up, and the old king is able to swing Goku out of the ring. Goku is devastated at this loss, but takes it nonetheless. Next, Vegeta steps in the ring, letting his pride get the better of him. He directly calls out Slug, the strongest of the offspring. The burly Namekian begins to chuckle and walks towards the ring, as Raditz tries to get Vegeta to switch with him. But the Saiyan refuses, and Piccolo shuts the idea down, as Vegeta had already entered the ring and therefore was the next participant. Slug didn't waste any time and grew to a huge hulking size, deciding he'd crush the prince like the bug he was. But Vegeta thinks quick and like Goku before him, bulks up to the Ultra Super Saiyan, making Goku yell out that it wasn't worth it for a few lucky hits and to go for a ring out. Vegeta only laughs at him and tells Goku that he thinks too nearly and catches the stomp of Slug. Vegeta is holding the massive foot up with a lot of strength and Slug is just taunting him. He knew his victory was a foot. Get it? A foot? What he doesn't realize is that Vegeta's hands are in a certain position and the prince roars out Final Flash! A bright yellow beam shoots through the Namekian's leg, making it explode in a green gore, and Slug screams in pain. Vegeta flies up and lands a good nice hammer fist right on the large Namekian's face, and this, with his balance already being stripped from him, causes Slug to fall out of the ring. Vegeta had won. Trunk sighs and enters the ring next. Of the two Namekians on the other side, one refused to move, the one known as Nail. Drum, the other Namekian, growled at him and began to move forward to walk into the ring. But Nail raises his hand, and in a flash, Drum was little more than a pile of dust, shocking Piccolo and the others as the Namekian had shown free will. Nail then looks to Piccolo and smirks, telling him that Gas had warned him all the concentrated good of four Namekians couldn't be snuffed out so easily. He was that good, and more importantly, he sensed that good still somewhere inside Piccolo. Piccolo scoffs at this and raises a hand to destroy the Namekian. But before he could, he's hit in the face hard. It was a snarling Gohan who did it. 
He ordered the Namekian to fight him now, and Piccolo is all too happy to accept as the two enter the ring. This was it, the fight of the century, the spawn of the Demon King versus the son of the universe's savior. The two squared off for merely a second before Gohan came charging up with a savage snarl on his face. Piccolo, growling at this, shot his eye beams, but Gohan only batted them away and rams into Piccolo's midsection, trying to drive him out of the ring. Piccolo expertly swung, and Gohan was sent flying away, out of the ring, just barely able to keep himself from touching the ground and being eliminated himself. Before Piccolo could warn the boy to fight like a warrior and not an animal, Gohan was already charging at him again, this time landing a solid blow and capitalizing by following up with another and another, more and more until the hits became almost hard to look at, especially since Gohan was crying while he savagely beat down on Piccolo. While this was happening, Trunks went to work on killing King Piccolo and Slug, which wasn't extremely hard, though he decides to spare Nail as the Namekians seemed to be on their side. Saiyan Pride was nice and all, but Piccolo had to be taken down. Before Trunks could enter the ring, Nail asked him to wait. He could currently sense more turmoil and darkness in Gohan's heart than Piccolo's. At the moment, it felt like Piccolo, for the first time in his life, was doing something for the good of someone else. Thankfully, Piccolo healed very well with the increased vitality from fusing so much, and he erects one of Slug's barriers, knocking Gohan away from him. The kid was almost crying tears of rage as he surged at him once again, but Piccolo took off his weighted gear, throwing it at Gohan, who had to avoid it at the last split second. This allowed Piccolo to land a devastating kick to Gohan's side, making a loud crack ring out as he definitely broke his arm, or maybe even worse. The kid writhed on the ground in pain for only a bit before pushing himself back onto his feet with his now messed up arm, probably doing even more damage to it. He was angry, he was stressed, and he was exhausted. He wanted to hurt Piccolo. He roared out, and his power exploded like never before. He then rushed Piccolo once again, still attacking his opponent mindlessly. Though hopelessly outclassed in terms of power, Piccolo was dodging and weaving around Gohan perfectly. He could read him like a book, and he didn't like this chapter at all. Gohan was trying way too hard. He was trying to please someone else in this fight, not himself. There was so much turmoil in his mind that the kid didn't even realize he already far surpassed Piccolo. He just didn't have any control over himself. He'd probably done more damage to his arm by trying to power through the pain than he would have just by not using that arm. Finally, he grows sick of seeing the kid he viewed as a prodigy reduced to a savage beast and slugs him in the stomach, doubling him over and winning him, finally allowing Piccolo a chance to speak. He knew what Gohan was trying to do. He knew what he was going through because he too was trying to be what someone else wanted him to be. And in the end, it didn't make him happy. This wasn't the battle he wanted. It was probably his own fault that it turned out like this. If he'd learned anything, it was that he had to be his own man, not the Demon King or Slug. He had to be who he was, Piccolo. And Gohan needed to be Gohan. That was the only way to live freely. Hearing the wise words, Gohan finally catches his breath and wipes away his tears with his good arm. Piccolo announces that this would be their final clash and begins to charge with a big Masenko. Gohan could tell that his heart wasn't really in the attack. Piccolo was just as tired as Gohan was, and he wanted to rest. With one arm, he reared back to charge of a Kamehameha, and the two released their blasts. The clash of yellow and blue lasts for only a few seconds before Piccolo was consumed by Gohan's attack. But there was no yell of pain, no cursing, only the telepathic message to Gohan and no one else. Thank you. The battle was over and the crisis was averted and Gohan was exhausted. He sat down in the arena to rest, knowing from now on he'd be Gohan and no one else. In the wake of Piccolo's defeat, things soon returned to normal, though Raditz was still strongly apologizing to Gohan for his behavior. He explained that he was just so sorry and that he was ashamed of himself for still being a damn coward after all this time. He shouldn't let his fear control him but he couldn't bear the thought of losing Snake or Zuko. That said, it wasn't an excuse to put all that pressure on Gohan. To his great surprise, Gohan only shakes his head understandingly and hugs his uncle with his good arm. Gohan chuckles and agrees that that was not Raditz's best idea, but he had also helped a really important lesson sink in along with Piccolo. Gohan had to be his own man. But to Gohan, he kind of thought that being a man could mean making mistakes and learning from them and coming back stronger. That's kind of what Saiyans did, wasn't it? Everyone's just astounded at how grown up Gohan seemed, and it just made sense. Ever since his uncle had drugged him and his father up in space to Namek mission and now the fighting with the androids and then Piccolo, Gohan hadn't really made his own life choices. So now that he really is, it seems like he has a lot of wisdom beyond his years. 
Yeah, Gohan is still a kid, but he's done a lot of growing up. Raditz was supremely proud of the man his nephew was quickly becoming, as was Goku and Turles. From here, the Neo Demon King Tournament Arena was destroyed, and the Z Fighters, Nail, Boma, and the reprogrammed androids gather up on the lookout to make a new wish. Luckily, there aren't really any witches that have to be made other than reviving anyone that died in the attack on South City by the androids and the victims of Cell before he had died at the hands of Vegeta. The androids really have nothing to do now, and so Boma invites them to come, live, and work at Capsule Court. Studying 17 and 18 cybernetics could maybe advance Capsule Court's medical studies by leaps and bounds, and 17 and 16 could be good training partners for Vegeta to keep him busy. Now, I could honestly see 17 accepting on the condition that he gets to test out new and dangerous Capsule Court vehicles. The faster, the better. 16 would probably be indifferent, and 18 claims that she really isn't interested in that. She then thumps Krillin on the forehead for staring at her, and explains that she'll be going with him, since she found him pretty cute, and she thinks he'll be fun to mess with. Nail decides he will journey up to the lookout to act as an attendee to Earth's Guardian as he used to on Namek before he fused into Ghast. And the rest of the Z Fighters will do what they did pretty much in canon for the most part. And from here, the next few years begin to blend together as Earth enters its most peaceful time that it has ever been in. Now of course, the Pure Blood Saiyans have all kept up their training. Goku, Raditz, and Turles, and their families decide to live together in one big house. This eats up a big chunk of Ox King's funds, but the renovations are made, and Goku begins his new farming business. Now that Goku's tiny home is suitable for three families, it's common to find Goku, Turles, and Raditz training in the mornings. Remember that Vegeta and Goku have a really good relationship with this timeline, so it isn't rare to see him joining in as well. Sixteen was a strong partner, but after every good sparring session, he would need repairs and improvements, which took time on Boma's part. His calm demeanor would also bug Vegeta sometimes. Because of this shared close contact, their families are also very close. Gohan has stopped training for the most part to focus on his studies, though training had now become a really fun bonding activity in his family, so sometimes he would do it with everyone. The second son of the Song family, Goten, had been born and had grown up with not only the influence of his father and brother, but of his uncle Turles, Raditz, and even his cousin Zuko. When Goten is born, Zuko, Gohan, and Goten form a very similar relationship to what Goku, Turles, and Raditz now have. They act very much like three brothers. So in this timeline, he's definitely not Trunks' lackey, and Trunks might be a bit more focused on training since it was just what his father focused on. While this timeline's Kid Trunks does develop a really friendly rivalry with Goten, the rivalry he will soon develop with Zuko is much less so. Zuko is a very precocious kid, but you saw the title and thumbnail, so we'll get back to him. Trunks' relationship with the now 10-year-old Zuko was strained at best. You see, because of Zuko's unique biology, as well as being a year or so older than Trunks, he just has the edge and strength, just a little smidgen. This also gains him all the attention of the adult Saiyans. Being a part of Zarbon's race and the Saiyan race had given Zuko a very strange transformation. Not only could he become a Super Saiyan at a young age, as Trunks and Goten can, but there was something on top of it. His muscles could bulk up a bit further than what was normal for a Super Saiyan, and his hair would grow a little more wild. His nails would elongate, and the buff and power was only so large, but it is very noticeable. Vegeta and Raditz, when discovering this, dubbed this offshoot of Super Saiyan as a monstrous Saiyan. Some kind of fusion between the monster transformation of Zarbon's race and Ozaru, as well as the Super Saiyan form. Now, full disclosure here, I've never really thought of a solid multiplier for this form. I'm walking a tightrope here because I don't want to make Zuko some Mary Sue, but at the same time, I want this to be a worthwhile boost for him. I think Zarbon's transformation only makes him like 1.3 times stronger, and I don't want to give Zuko a full 10 times from the parts of this that are a part of Ozaru. So maybe his Super Saiyan is worth a 56.3 times multiplier, and if you guys have any good ideas, then definitely let me know down in the comments below. Raditz is extremely proud in his son, and very intrigued in this power he has, while Vegeta was just as intrigued, and want not only to see this power of Zuko pushed to his limits, but also to push Trunks to further compete with the older boy. And this is the root of Trunks' resentment towards Zuko. And because of this, Zuko very quickly comes to resent his father, and in a way, the world. See, Zuko is the only person that has to deal with looking different from all the other normal humans around him. Yeah, we used to have the animal race people that looked really different like the Dog King and Oolong, but these character designs slowly slide out of the series, and it quickly becomes to be more, you know, human-looking character designs. So all the civilians and background characters are very homogenous. So seeing Zuko's blue skin, reptilian eyes, and freakishly long orange hair always gets him stared at and whispered about. 
Zuko's mother, Princess Snake, would also be looked at this way, but she didn't seem to care. She had spent a long time in Otherworld and had been stared at before. In her own words, she was just too mature to let the opinions of men that were not named Raditz affect what she thought of herself. So in that, Zuko loses a lot of solidarity in his mother not really sharing his plight. This all culminates in Zuko finally rebelling. He actually goes to Bowman and asks for the Dragon Radar, and when she does not give it to him, he steals it and spends the day collecting the Dragon Balls. Once done, he uses his one wish to ask Shinron to make him look like everyone else and allow him to maintain his powers, and the wish is granted. When Zuko finally returns home, Raditz and Snake are furious at him. What are you thinking, Zuko? You can't just change who you are! But it isn't fair, Dad! What would you even know about what it's like to look different? Uncle Goku, Turles, and you all look normal. So do my cousins, and Trunks, and he teases me all the time. I just want to be normal! Okay, first off, have you seen my hair? Secondly, this is not about how people look at you. This is about how you deal with your problems. Not to mention that by trying to look like somebody else, you're rejecting your mother and how she looks. I used to be a coward, son. So I ain't raising one. From now on, you and I will train every day until Shenron is ready to grant a wish. And then you are going to change rights back, young man. Am I clear? Yes, sir. And so, one year of very rough training took place for Zuko. Afterwards, his power had grown and so had the darkness in his heart. Raditz tried his hearts to bond with Zuko and understand his plight, but he was a Saiyan and his emotions were always hard to grasp. He had learned from his debacle with training Gohan and had done his best to try and help Zuko express those negative emotions and have an outlet for them. He even tries to help Zuko center himself through meditation, but nothing seems to work. Zuko is just too hung up on his appearance to move past this. As for the other characters, as many people have predicted in this timeline, Turles finally finds love in the form of Launch. Though it is definitely one of those playground relationships where they bully each other to express their attraction to each other. And it is a very new relationship, only having taken place about a year ago, meaning that Launch has not even had a child yet. Also, remember that Piccolo didn't present himself to the world as Cell did. No one knew of Piccolo's threat to the Earth, so Hercule becomes the champ. But he isn't as well loved and his daughter Videl would likely grow up without the same amount of training and as such she might not become a crime fighter. It's possible to argue that she would, but this would also mean that if Gohan does attend Orange Star High School, which he likely would and begin crime fighting, Videl likely wouldn't care too significantly. There's no real rivalry between them there, but I do think that they would be attracted to each other just because of who they are. If this were to happen, then Gohan would never be pushed into the tournament by Videl, and because of this, no one else really enters it. I believe that at some point, Supreme Kai would approach either Goku or Kami and Nail on the lookout to ask them for their help in a coming problem. This video is sponsored by Crimson Manifesto, Knuckles OX, and Jelpy. Hello everyone, and welcome to the official 5 year anniversary of my channel. If you scroll all the way back far enough in my career, back to August 26th of 2018, you'll find my first and most clumsily made videos at the time. The first of which being my take on the scenario of Goku taking Raditz upon his offer to join the Saiyans. I won't be recapping here for the sake of time, but I have included links to the original story up till now in the iCard in the description. So if you'd like to brave the older stuff and catch up, feel free to revisit that first video of mine when you do. Fair warning, the story is admittedly flawed, but regardless, I have some pride in it being my launching point, and I still think the story as a whole bears multiple strong moments of storytelling. I admittedly used to have lots of issue taking criticism with the story, but now looking back, I'm harder on it than anyone else properly, hence my ability to poke fun at it and still try to get a good story out of it to end it off, because I think I can also note its issues better than most. And the number one issue in my opinion is that the story simply has too many competing ideas which could hold their own scenario extremely easily. If not all having multiple what ifs within themselves just as prompts alone. If you break them down, those being what if Turles was canon or turned good, what if the Dragon Ball Zero fan manga was canon, what if a bit of filler slash games were canon with a reference to the video games featuring Princess Snake and Raditz getting together, what if all movies were canon pretty much, and most obviously what if Raditz survived or turned good. So noting that, as I try to bring the original run of this amalgamated concept to a satisfying close, I'm also letting you know to be on the lookout for my takes on some of these individual ideas that also deserve more focused explorations in the future. Kinda like my take on What If Piccolo was canon as a more focused take on that one specific villa character touched on in the first What If Relay. Both of those are also linked in the iCard description for you to check out by the way. For now, make sure to do the usual YouTube stuff. Grab a snack, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. As it's finally time for the finale of What If Goku Joined Raditz, the Faux Tournament, Zuko's Rebellion, and the Overstuffed Finale. Attention!
Attention peons! Soon a new era shall befall this wretched universe. The era of Majin Buu. To celebrate this, I, Bobbity, shall be hosting a grand tournament where the best of the best may battle it out to determine who is worthy of living to see the new age. To enter, one must only present themselves and any compatriots as well as innocent sacrifices to Buu's glory. The start of the dark tournament draws nigh, so prepare yourselves and cherish what little time you have left in your fragile illusion of peace. This message is projected psychically across the galaxy to all the scum and denizens of the Demimond who might answer the call, with one particular rogue finding himself rather intrigued by the prospect of this so-called dark tournament, that being Bojack. Having recently escaped from North Kai's planet, the notorious space pirate is eager to crack some heads, and if this wizard's offering the venue, he ain't gonna refuse. The only question is where he can get himself a nice innocent sacrifice, though fortunately, here his navigator Bujin is able to provide an answer, pointing out the nearest inhabited world, a little boring mud ball called Earth, with supposedly a few decent fighters. Perfect. Touching down in a secluded canyon, Bojack's crew do not even need to scan for power levels, as at the moment, three moderately strong ones are flared, clearly being in the midst of a battle. Following them to their source, the rogues find that the fighters are children, two of whom appear to be Saiyan, while the third is shockingly a hair clan member like themselves from the looks of it. No matter, if they're gonna grab them, they gotta grab them all, since they can't afford to raise alarms anyway. Pouncing on the brats just when they are beginning to tire from their petulant sparring, it is child's play to subdue them and return to the ship, no one the wiser to their heinous deed. However, this is less a testament to their strength as it is to the fact that at the moment, Mount Poundsu is specifically the Sone Clan find themselves with a different set of guests, those being the Supreme Kai and his attendant Kapito. It seems they too have heard of this dark tournament and have come to enlist the hero's help, being familiar with their work from their battles with the Code family and the Neo Demon King Piccolo. Always up for a fight, Goku, Raditz, and Turles are more than happy to partake, even if they are a bit iffy on the whole innocent sacrifice part, though Gohan is forbidden from joining them since he has school and isn't allowed to be pulled out for a silly universe ending conflict. Figuring Vegeta would also be a good candidate, Goku gives Boma a call, though it seems she has bigger things in her mind, having just received a notice that Trunks' capsule phone has been disconnected from service, meaning either he's been hurt badly enough to damage a phone that can survive Vegeta's training, or he's left Earth. And if he's in either of those positions, it's not a stretch to assume Goten and Zuko will be too. Furrowing his brow, Goku tries to sense their energies, quickly confirming that they're not on Earth anymore, and wherever they are, they're too weak to sense. Understandably, this worries Boma, who snaps at her old friend and to her husband to find her son, while in his other ear, the Saiyan hears Chi Chi and Snake repeat this sentiment, just as forcefully. Brusquely, Kibito tries to return the topic to the threat of the Dark Tournament, though this is a rather poor choice. As in venomous tones, Chi Chi informs the Kai that the biggest threat right now is her to whoever took her baby boy, and anyone who stands in her way of getting him back. In a conciliatory tone of his own, Shin suggests that what Kibito meant is they were likely taken as the entry fees, so to speak, for the Dark Tournament, before quilling a little under the matriarch's glare, she is at him to explain. When Shin is done, Chi Chi looks about ready to either pass out or explode, though before she can do either, Snake, who feels the same as her sister-in-law, states that if their sons are being taken to the tournament, then she'll make sure to get them there too. Briefly, Shin attempts to explain that they don't actually know where it's being held. Though eyes flashing with determination, Snake retorts that's because he's a good little Kai, with good little Kai sources of information, whereas she has spent long enough adjacent to hell that she made a few shadier contacts who might just be perfect for this sort of situation. To this end, she sets to work, using Goku as a transmitter to King Kai, who can in turn put her in contact with her friends in Hell. After a brief conversation, the former princess of Snake Way reveals the tournament is being held on Planet Zune in seven days, meaning they don't have a moment to lose. Agreeing with his wife, Raditz leads the charge by heading to Capscorp to get the ship ready while tasking Goku with dusting off their old space gear. Fiercely, Snake declares she's coming too, unbreakable resolve in her tone, and though Raditz wants to object, he can't deny that any ally with knowledge of the shady underworld they're stepping into will be a big help. And so it is that just under an hour later, Goku, Raditz, Vegeta, Snake, Shin, and Kibito are on board the Capsule Corp ship bound for Planet Zoom. It is only as they pass Jupiter that Raditz actually thinks to take a head count, realizing entirely too late that in the haste of the situation and the in-depth discussion about why villains kept hosting tournaments, as well as his worry over Zuko and the fate of the universe, they'd completely forgotten Turles. Meanwhile, the final pure Saiyan sits back at Goku's house fuming as Chi Chi and Launch try to praise him for being the mature one, remaining here on Earth to defend the planet, since who knows what could happen. Speaking of uncertainty, Goten, Trunks, and Zuko have just woken up from unconsciousness, finding themselves bound and collared with something that seems to be suppressing their ability to access key. In the gloomy hold of the ship, a pair of wicked eyes flash as Beedo chuckles that it's about time those squirts woke up, before yelling for his captain to come say hello to their guests. Stomping into view out of the shadows, Bojack welcomes them all to his humble craft, and stating that they'll be here for the duration of their voyage to Zoom, at which point he's afraid it'll be the end of the line for them. 
or at the very least, it will be for two of them. He then turns his grin on Zuko, saying that he could be spared this fate though, if and he's willing to join his crew, since it was only right that they had it just stuck together, even if Zuko had weird looking ears. Angrily, Trunks declares that even Zuko's not stupid enough to take that offer, but in a desire to be free, while also spiting his longtime bully and rival, Zuko accepts, much to the other boy's shock. Calling him a good lad, Beto cuts Zuko's bindings before removing his collar, while Bojack gives him the tour, excited to have what he perceives as a young Hedogen on the crew after so long. For the next few days, the captain does not like Zuko out of his sight, partially out of distrust, but mostly due to this fascination. For the most part, Zuko finds the galaxy soldiers to be decent hosts, even if that Zangya lady with the cruel eyes kind of reminds him of his mom, often eating and sparring with them, since they made it clear they want him with them for something called the Dark Tournament. Finally, when he does get a bit of alone time, he sneaks back to see Goten and Trunks, checking in on them and bringing them some food, though always refusing their request to be freed, with him even getting some satisfaction in watching Trunks squirm every time he suggests he might let Bojack sacrifice him. Eventually, Zuko's dedication to the pirate life is tested when Bojack insists they pillage a passing freighter. Though he had told himself he was only doing this to be free long enough to make an escape plan, when the boarding begins, he feels his blood rush like never before, unleashing his full powers against their victims and being praised for it in a way his parents had never done. He even wonders if this might have been how his dad felt back in the day. He feels good, seen, respected. After this, it becomes much harder to convince himself that this is a ruse, or even that he wants it to be, with him being the ones to suggest they take the freighter crew as sacrifices for the tournament, figuring he at least would like to help his cousin Goten weasel out of his dire fate. Unfortunately, this is less successful than he had hoped, with Bojack taking the prisoners and declaring that he'll still sell the other boys to the wizard hosting, since in their line of work it never hurts to pick up a bit of extra loot. Finally, the Heron crew arrive on planet Zune where the creme de la creme of scum are all gathered, handing over their new freighter prisoners to be sacrificed. The newly dubbed Team Bojack are granted entry to the event, taking their place in the pits to await their opening fights. Up above, Bobby watches all the fighters along with his guests, Hoy of Kanats, Garlic Jr. of the Makio Star, and Commander Sword Bay of the now defunct Frieza Force. As the current four biggest names of the Galactic Underworld, they have all gathered together to spectate and make exorbitant bets on the outcome of the fights. Not that it matters to Bobby, as he has something far grander than money in mind. When the last sacrifice to Boo is made, Bobbity calls a start to the fights, while at the same moment, the Dragon Team sneak in, with the Saiyans and Snake knocking out four fighters and taking their places in the matches. Having run the gamut of the galaxy's worst, these early fights are nothing to the heroes, though they do come across a few interesting new faces, like a noble swordsman named Tapion, who is apparently only here to find a way to prevent the revival of a monster of his own, and a purple alien with a chilling resemblance to Frieza. Snake even manages to show that her training on Aratus has paid off, as she's able to take out Zangya, showing no mercy when she sees the woman seemingly guarding Zuko from leaving, though the real action begins when Bojack is paired up with Raditz. Furiously, the long-haired Saiyan orders the pirate to release his son of the other boys, though giving a belly laugh, Bojack retorts that he can have the others if he wants to rescue them from the wizard's chambers, but Zuko is one of them, having joined of his own free will, so he stays. Rage only growing at this creep trying to come between him and his kid, Raditz responds with a punch to the pirate's jaw, now in Super Saiyan 2, though still, Bojack laughs, meeting this transformation with his super full power Harrigen form. This quickly devolves into repeated intense high-speed clashes, with the energy from this fight alone being more than enough to reawaken Majin Buu from his slumber. Bursting from his egg, the Majin's first instructions are to destroy the trio of underworld kingpins, giving Bobbity unrivaled dominion, before being unleashed on the fighters down below with permission to wipe them all out if it amuses him. Despite his bravado, as the first sign of Boo, Bojack is smart enough to flee, using his crew as meat shields to cover his escape. This quickly disillusions Zuko to any notions of Bojack being anything more than a coward, and so wanting to right the wrongs of his recent jerkish behavior, he uses the chaos to sneak into Bobbity's chambers so he can save Trunks and Goten. This in turn puts him into direct conflict with Demon King Deborah, who is serving as tournament security. And though he cannot beat the Demon King alone, when Trunks and Goten see that Zuko is fighting for them, they encourage him, with Trunks even coaching the other boy to use the Demon's Stone Spit to turn their college to stone, freeing them. Now all able to fight again, Trunks and Goten combine their powers as Zuko's, managing to erase the Devil Man with a triple Kamehameha before rushing to join the others currently fighting against Majin Buu. Back in the fight, Buu has proven himself insatiable, even turning on his master and leaving him near dead, meaning it is up to the Z-Warriors to save the day. However, due to all this bloodshed, as well as the bit of chaos already stirred from Snake's attendants scouring and accidentally terrorizing the denizens of the heavens, this influx of evil souls causes a stir in hell, as the accident sees a young ogre accidentally becoming host to a well of evil energy and producing a very similar chaotic monster to the one currently terrorizing the living universe below. Sensing this chaos, which to this creature seems like fun, the newly dubbed Janimba accepts the teleporting abilities and soon arrives to make the acquaintance of Majin Buu, 
Upon seeing the other rotund menace, Boo cannot help but laugh, calling the pudgy yellow monster tubby and funny looking. But Janemba only seems to take joy in this, while everyone else is extremely confused, laughing and dancing so hard that he trips Boo up and causes him to fall, looking funny now himself. Of course, this angers the Majin, with this creating a chaotic clash between the two while the bystanders are forced to back away in order to not be destroyed in this cartoony clash, now all thoroughly confused. Feeling themselves the only sane ones of the group left, Cooler, Shin, and Raditz all share a similar inclination, that they should get the hell out of here, no pun intended. But their attempts to leave are quickly halted by the clashing monsters, who evidently want them to stay and witness who will be victorious, and so without a better choice, they decide to rally their remaining troops to ready an attack for the last one standing. As the stakes ramp up, the two even change forms, becoming far more serious and menacing looking fighters, and eventually making it evident that they mean to absorb the other in order to become the supreme force of pure chaos. Thinking this may be what his cursed life has continued on for, Tapion reasons Hirutagarn may actually be able to help here, subsequently relinquishing control over the monster to release it and therefore only make the battle even more chaotic, as Tapion is ultimately beaten back and forced back to his regular self, as Boo and Janemba see no issue in working together surely to get rid of this not fun guy as they call him. Unfortunately, this results in them conglomerating into a completely new force of chaos, who roars his name as Janembu. Thus, when Raditz and the rest unleash their combined attack, it is sadly only enough to destabilize this evil Jin ogre into a goopy form as he regenerates casually, all hope appearing to be lost here. That is, until Princess Snake pulls out an old trick, shifting into her snake form and coiling around Janembu to hold him down as he tries to heal, causing Zuko and Raditz's hearts to freeze in shock, as their wife and mother battles the most dangerous entity in the universe by far for them. As such, they mean to rush to her aid, but Shin and Babidi hold Raditz back as the wizard reveals a secret weapon to the Big Saiyan and Goku, asking the brothers to join forces one last time. As Zuko reaches his mother and sees Janembu reforming and attacking her, he grows more enraged than he ever has before, seemingly breaking the limit of his monstrous Super Saiyan state and entering a higher grade of it. But he knows even this is not enough. To save his beloved mother, he must embrace even more of himself, and so in a burst of divine light, he achieves his full potential, achieving a godly serpent form of his own, which he is able to entwine around his moms as they form a catechus to trap Janembu, synchronizing their key to unleash a mother-son corrosive gas blast, which keeps Janembu in a state of perpetually melting, forcing him to use all his energy just to maintain his jelly-like shape. With this opening as a threat to victory, a new warrior makes himself known, the Patara fusion of Goku and Raditz, Radito, who together waste absolutely no time in sneakily obliterating Boo, wanting no real parts of a fight against something so far beneath him. It is only when Janembu is defeated that Babidi mentions that this fusion is permanent, though no sooner are the words out of his mouth that the brothers split apart, as Raditz yells that he's gonna wring the spud's neck. In the aftermath of this heroine clash, our surviving heroes and anti-heroes decide to part ways, with Tapion thanking the group, as he now feels freed of Rudigarn's influence and no longer has to worry about Hoi, while Cooler states that he will return one day for revenge to what they did to his brother and father, before leaving himself. In contrast, Trunks and Zuko decide to put past grudges behind them, becoming friends at last and subsequently closer to Goten, truly making themselves into a trio. A week later, when the Z-Fighters return to Earth, they find the planet in minor disarray, with Kami and Nail seeming rather exasperated, while Gohan and Turles are obviously exhausted, having come off a big battle of their own. When asked about this, however, Turles is rather tight-lipped out of playful spite, simply jesting that he'd love to tell his best friend of his and Gohan's epic clash with the legendary Super Saiyan. But he's afraid that knowing Raditz, the other Saiyan would simply forget, and so this tale remains one for only those lucky enough to witness his glory firsthand. From here, the years and time will begin to pass quickly, as more and more threats rear their head, such as the arrival of yet another deity bent on destruction, which sees the Saiyans all forced to collect their power together into Goku as their chosen champion, and the return of Cooler, now wielding a powerful golden form that Raditz wielding his own divine powers to match Snake and Zuko's defeats, earning his own revenge against the Cold family, but sparing the other brother, and eventually reforming him, as Goku and Gohan had always talked about. Even Bojack comes back to Earth one day, seeking to re-recruit Zuko, but this is met with a blast to the face, as the boy finally stands up to and defeats the pirate, becoming his own man, at last. Following this is a tournament against the sister universe, and a reunion with Trunks, whose timeline is being played by an enemy who eerily resembles Turles, yet is revealed to be an alternate universe version of Goku, suffering from a case of the body snatchings. After this, it is yet another tournament, and some battles against evil goat wizards, bounty hunters, and just about every other evil doer one could think of. However, none of which have what it takes to truly shatter this era of peace, and all thanks to our hero son Goku accepting his brother's hand on that fateful day. And this is where we end this story and far too long awaited milestone for this channel. I truly hope you've all enjoyed the wild and wacky ride this entire story has been, as well as the time capsule it has been for my timeline as a creator, and one of my finest examples I can point to in support of my number one piece of advice to those who think about doing YouTube style content creation, just go ahead and do it. See how much fun you have, and what kind of audience and community you can build. 
Don't stress out about it so much, and don't try to make it all about numbers. These have been really core lessons for me as a creator, and they kind of shine through in this finale really well, which I'm really proud of. In the end, regardless of the fact that this finale is purposely bloated and irreverent, overstuffed with too many characters competing for screen time, and rushed to get to its conclusion, I genuinely do hope you enjoyed the journey and had fun. Way back when, I'm certain I had a slightly different and likely more drawn out vision that is more standard and predictable for what this finale and kind of the rest of the story would have been. You know, certain fusions helping out to beat a fairly standard Boo Saga, maybe some more of the movies thrown here and there, and then adaptations of Super, and then maybe a nice little GT special to boot. But for one thing, I'm getting a bit mad towards certain events of Super, especially now during the superhero adaptation of the manga. Though, fingers are crossed, because at the time of writing, Goten and Trunks have a really big chance to redeem it and make it all worth it by making just a really big divergence from the manga canon interpretation to the movie canon interpretation, but I'm really hoping they jump on that opportunity. Also, I admittedly never scripted this entire story out, so I can't even really go back and see what my original vision was. And once I kind of realized a lot of the flaws of it and began to see how cumbersome it was to write parts, I lost lots of motivation to actually tie it up any time too soon back then. Nowadays, I still don't really write stories I'll completely start to finish before actually making them unless they're collabs, and even then, those are often subject to change when they get really good brainstorm sessions going, so, you know, it's kind of hit or miss. But I do make very basic notes of the broad strokes I know I want within the story, and I at least had some of those for this one. Like, for example, one of the best aspects of this story that I knew I was going to do all the way back in part one is setting up a beam clash between an evil or antagonistic Piccolo and Super Saiyan 2 as a twisted version of the Cell games. I also knew that I wanted Raditz's kid to be the main character of the Boo Saga, but that's about it. A lot of this was coming as I was doing it. And even then, this was half a decade ago now. Anyway, do the YouTube stuff like I told you in the beginning of the video. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Scream at me if you think I didn't do the story justice, all that stuff. Before we go, however, I of course owe a few shout outs to the entire community or Plus Ultra fam for number one, watching this channel for this long. Again, it really does mean a lot. Thank you so much for the views. To Mr. Negative for helping me and providing me with character edits, as well as anybody else who might have had art featured here that might just get featured in the description. To Pickle Dill for helping me convert my notes to a more fleshed out script. And of course, to the supporters of the channel whom you should consider joining for a myriad of perks, as well as to help the channel grow. These amazingly generous people are Knuckles OX, Crimson Manifesto, Jelpy, Zach Haji, Pizza15X, Aaron Winters, Normandy1998, Xiao Pai, Coder SV3, Ronin Charizard, Daniel Smith, Dylan Wolf Dog 31, Infernity Beast 326, J Ray, Johnny, Narku, Omar Cousin, Snow Slash Memes and More, Steven Norton, Taryn, The Shadows, Vegeta What Ifs, Alamancer, B, Lyman Rogers, Omar Muhammad, Aiko, Arcane of the Heart, Tay, Enervated, John Sullivan, Corporal Atkins, Trent Rouse, Dark Shadows, Pokemon Trainer Cam, River Joy, Elijah Edwards, Mr. Hamtastic, Jesus is King, Half an Onion, Angel Gonzalez, David Spaulding, Lil T910, Joseph Lau, Blaze9526, Trainer Red164, Luca Reynolds, Baron Stormblade, Ono, Chris Macriano, Lily, Simroth, Red Violet, DeAndre, Gerald Smith, John Self, Jacob Whitker, Massive Oak Woodtree, Demon Set, True Trey, Dutch McGee 101, Bruce Boswick, Robert Arstegard, Illis Cyclops, Craig Scheiman, Jao Madden, King Music For Real, Ballcore, Zach Eubanks, Crab Trooper 4552, NBA Fan, Courtney Hawkins, Orion 101, Christian Kyler, Dominic Wiltz, Jester DeMille, Cyber Samurai, The Story Buster, One Cold Pirate, Ganning 667, Dr. Ember, Chris, Kieran Lightfoot, Uga Booga, and Cure Skywalker. Once again, thank you guys for everything you do and directly supporting the channel and helping it grow. But that said, that's all I got for you today. So as always, take care of yourselves and the world around you. Happy five year anniversary and go beyond plus ultra. And I'll see you guys next time.